What's up ladies and gents? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was Reborn as a Zuku with System Quirk? Part 6. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Are you sure you're good to drive? asked Izuku. I remember the route, so I can take the wheel if you want to take a short nap. Though she knew Izuku didn't have a license, Shino paused to consider his words while staring off into space with notably flushed cheeks. Izuku hadn't let up on her even when they took a shower together, so she would be lying if she said she wasn't feeling out of sorts. Shaking her head, Shino replied, Forget it. I wouldn't know what to say if the cops pulled us over. Just give me a few minutes to cool down, and I'll be fine. Punctuating her words, Shino pressed the blackout button that tinted her windows before turning on the AC and reclining in her seat. Izuka's eyes were drawn to her voluminous melons as she did so. But instead of gawking like a fool, he emulated Shino's actions, reclining in his seat and closing his eyes. Sneaking a peek at Izuku from the corner of her eyes, Shino breathed an internal sigh of relief when she saw him resting with his eyes closed. Her self-esteem had taken a hit when Izuku began treating her like an actual cat, and due to her enamored state, she couldn't help playing along. She had even started meowing partway through, so she wasn't even sure how to look at him right now, much less engage in conversation. With Shino entering an absent-minded daze as she observed him, Izuku caused her to startle quite a bit when he asked, do you want to cuddle or something with his eyes still closed? Ugh. Not sure how to respond, Shino scratched her cheek and looked around with an awkward look. She wasn't sure what she was searching for, but she promptly gave up when Izuku reclined further, patting his chest as he said, Come on! Though she blushed to the very tips of her ears, Shino only hesitated for a few seconds before crawling over the center console and curling up in his lap with her head against his chest. She felt like a complete idiot, but even though Izuku was nearly half her age, she couldn't help feeling a sense of safety and security in his warm embrace. This kid is way too good at handling women, thought Shino, her heart beating a little quicker when Izuku's hand came to rest on her rear gently caressing it as if it were completely natural. With Izuku and Shino arriving in the late afternoon, around the time Class 1A was preparing Curry as a group, Ryuko darted over to them, exuding her usual hyperactive energy as she asked, Where the heck have the two of you been? You should have been back hours ago. Without waiting for a response, Ryuko began to circle Shino, sniffing her up and down with a cat-like expression on her face. Her mother was a cat-like heteromorph, so even though she lacked furry features, Ryuko senses rivaled an actual cat's, and that was before becoming a member of Izuka's party. Though she briefly narrowed her eyes, Ryuko wasn't upset that Shino had jumped the gun and gotten ahead of her. Instead, she covered her mouth with her paw-like glove, licking her lips before softly asserting, someone got laid, with a catty smile, swatting Ryuko with her hand. A hint of embarrassment marred Shino's serious expression as she said, Stop it, Pixie. The students might suspect something if you make a scene. Oh, please, replied Ryuko. What's the point of even keeping it a secret? You disappeared nearly the entire day and came back looking like you just finished battling an entire league of villains. Before Shino could respond, Ryuko spread her hands and shrugged in mock helplessness as she added, Besides, most of these brats have 100 intelligence and access to the proximity function. You and Izuku were in the same place for nearly seven and a half hours, and your vitalities kept going down. Good luck convincing them you were having a chat. Though Ryuko wasn't exactly dumb, Shino was caught off guard by how sharp the former was behaving. She didn't feel too different after going from 81 to 100 intelligence, 
But Ryuko seemed completely different after going from 61 to the same value. A 66.67% increase in intelligence was no joke. Seeing through Shino's thoughts, Ryuko covered her mouth, uttering her characteristic meow meow meow, laughed before abruptly focusing her gaze on Izuku, making a scratching gesture as she mused, You won't be eluding my claws this time, my adorable little muscle kitten. I was already going to be the one training you, but now we can have lots and lots of fun together as well. Without waiting for Izuku or Shino to respond, Ryuko abruptly turned away and ran back to the location of Class 1A. Nearly everyone that wasn't actively cooking or working on something had been observing them. So Shino's expression became progressively ruddy until she said, I'm going to head inside to take a rest. You should join your classmates or head inside to do the same. Understanding that Shino's words weren't an invitation to rest with her, Izuku calmly replied, I'll return to my class. But before that, I wanted to thank you for earlier. Your words this morning helped me sort out some of the thoughts that have been bothering me. I'll be sure to repay you plentifully in the future. Reading between the lines of Izuku's words, Shino's expression became ruddier as she responded with a faint, sure, before abruptly running off. Izuku's eyes followed her, but only for a brief moment before he turned to his classmates and made his way over, readily joining the largest group of girls as it was no longer a secret that they were dating. Though they had skirted around the issue during dinner, Mineta didn't hesitate to voice everyone's thoughts during their shared bathing time, asking, Midoriya, what's your relationship with Mandalay and the wild, wild pussycats? As he had already gotten permission from the girls, Izuka didn't hesitate to respond. I'm going to be sleeping with all three of them. The reasons why are none of your concern. Providing his best Dio impression, Mineta arched his back, hands spread and resembling claws as he screeched, W-H-I-Y-Y-Y-Y. Does it matter? Asked Izuku, his expression and tone calm as he added, You weren't exactly in the running to be their suitors. Stop envying others and focus on improving yourself. You're not doing yourself any favors by acting like a desperate and perverted degenerate. While Mineta was staring at Izuku like he wanted to strangle him, Ida raised his hand and said, Though our motivations are different, I'm with Mineta on this one. School rules prohibit illicit relationships between staff and students. Even if you're all consenting adults, you should set a better example as the vice class representative. Shaking his head, Izuku revealed, I won't be vice class representative for much longer. Once the second term begins, I'll be taking credit by exams to test out of all the general education classes. I'll also be getting my provisional hero license in the next couple of weeks, so I'll soon be a student in name only. As for why I'm doing this, well, you'll find out in the next three to six months. I haven't been given permission to talk about it just yet. Reacting to Izuka's remark about being a student in name only, Kirishima replied, No way. Does that mean you won't be coming to class anymore? That's a real bummer. Making a SOSO gesture with his left hand, Izuku replied, I'm only testing out of the general education classes, so I'll still show up for foundational heroics training when I'm not busy with my work studies. I just have a lot of things to prepare in a very limited time, so don't expect to see me too much in the next three to six months. After that, we'll probably be working together on a daily basis. You're speaking like something big's about to go down, said Bakugo, seated in the bath with his arms crossed. Nodding his head, Izuku revealed, It's an event that had already started to shake the world, but it's being kept under wraps to avoid panic. I would tell you more, but I've been told to keep it a secret. That's bullshit, asserted Bakugo. If it's important, you should just say it, you sure dash. Suppressing the urge to call Izuku a shitty nerd, Bakugo's expression darkened as he said, Just tell us. You already revealed the secret of your quirk, so what's the point of keeping this one? It's so you can have at least one peaceful summer break as students of UA, replied Izuku. Telling you that might make you worry, but you can at least pretend everything's okay if you don't know the truth. If you're keen on finding out, regardless of my warnings, feel free to pester the principal and all might. They're the ones that asked me to keep it a secret. Rising to his feet, 
Izuku preempted Bakugo's reaction and simultaneously caused an awkward silence to descend the bath by saying, Enjoy the rest of your bath, gentlemen. I have some kittens to attend. Without waiting for anyone to respond, Izuku stepped out of the bath and headed for the changing room. He hadn't actually made arrangements to sleep with any of the pussycats, but he doubted they would decline if he chose to sleep in their beds. Shino presented herself as a calm, reliable, an intelligent beauty in public, but she was incredibly submissive in the bedroom. Ryuko was apparently still a virgin, but she had all the telltale signs of a nympho. As for Tomoko, Izuku wasn't too sure about her, but his intuition told him she would be very active in the bedroom, driven by a healthy curiosity. With her ability to uncover people's weaknesses, well, it was bound to be an interesting experience. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku prepared to change into his evening clothes, but paused when he noticed his underwear was missing. Not his fresh pair, but the ones he had changed out of before getting in the bath. This has to be Toga's or Komori's doing, thought Izuku. There was no one on duty outside to prevent people from entering the wrong changing room, and they were the two most likely culprits due to being fairly diehard members of his fan club. There was one more person it could have been, but Izuku willfully blocked that possibility from his thoughts. Fortunately, Izuku received his answer fairly quickly when he changed into his evening, wear, and grabbed his laundry, preparing to take it back to his room. The moment he did so, a small piece of black fabric fell onto the ground, a garment Izuku immediately recognized as a pair of side-tie lace panties. The only girl in his harem that wore such panties was, somewhat amusingly, Achiko, but Izuku had never seen her wear pure black before. She preferred pastel colors like pale pink, sky blue, and soft green. Darker colors weren't completely out of the question, but she would want him to see her wearing them. Picking up the delicate undergarment, Izuku inspected the band, finding no name, but seeing that the size didn't match any of his girls. It was only one size larger than Achiko's panties, but he could confidently rule her out as most girls had a habit of wearing clothes that were a bit too small. In other words, the panties belonged to a girl whose waist and but were a bit larger than Achiko's firm and pillowy assets. They're definitely togas, thought Izuku. Komori was a fairly petite girl, and while Izuku could totally see her wearing black lace to try and seduce him, Class 1B had a different bathing and training schedule than 1A. They also dwelled on the opposite side of the lodge, so it would be much too risky to try and swap their underwear. Placing the panties into his pocket, Izuka moved to leave the changing room, but stopped at the entrance. It was very faint, but he could hear someone breathing for the briefest of moments, compelling him to look toward an area of the changing room that appeared empty at a glance. As he did so, the pitter-patter of bare footsteps against Tile echoed through the changing room as an invisible figure darted past him. Unfortunately for the person in question, invisibility didn't prevent Izuku from inspecting his target status. Name, Himiko Toga. Title, Party Invitation Required. Quirk, Transform, Invisibility Vestige. Bond Level, 99. Current Level, 16. Effective Level, 59. Attributes. Strength. 25. Agility. 22. Vitality. 235. Intelligence. 85. Dexterity. 29. Luck. 205. Free attributes. 80. Perks. Party invitation required. Though he was certain he could get away with it, Izuka decided not to overcomplicate things by seeking out the wild wild pussycats in the middle of the training camp. Instead, he rolled up his futon and used it as a cushion, reclining against it as he texted Rumi to inform her about the possibility of him knocking up the pussycats. Contrasting Izuka's expectations, Rumi's reply wasn't to tease him or dismiss the matter outright. Well, it was, in a way, but her full response was, Why are you telling me this? Did you think I'd be jealous? Or were you wanting to knock me up as well? Before his brain could finish rebooting fully, Izuka's fingers typed. That's up to you. Either way, I intend to keep shaboinking you like I'm trying to knock you up. Unlike her usual, 
Instantaneous responses. Rumi took nearly a full minute to answer. Cheeky bastard. Then, causing Izuka's heart to skip a beat, she promptly appended, Then I'll make you feed me birth control mouth to mouth in the future. If you refuse to, or forget, you only have yourself to blame if something happens. This damn rabbit, thought Izuku, a fiery light glowing in his eyes as he read Rumi's response multiple times. It might sound a little shameless, but he didn't care if he had one or more children. There were a few times in his previous life when he donated to a sperm bank to earn some extra cash. He might think differently when he actually had kids, but unless the mother insisted he plays the part of a parent, he didn't mind taking a back seat. At the very least, he wouldn't be a helicopter papa. After asserting that he would shaboink her senseless if he weren't at summer camp, Izuka's eyes became even fierier as Rumi replied, I'm technically a teacher now. I could come over and help you train. I need to talk to those hat cats anyways. Though he was already scheduled to train and conduct experiments with Ryuko, Izuka didn't hesitate to reply. You've successfully riled me up. Get that beautiful brown g -at over here. Don't make me kick your butt, threatened Rumi. However, as that was half the reason he wanted her to come over, Izuku replied, I could use the AP. Then prepare your rear for a beating, messaged Rumi, countered by Izuku quipping. I tell you to prepare your coochie, but we both know you're wet just thinking about how I'm going to shaboink you. Though he felt like he was crossing the line a bit, Izuku had been feeling especially bold all day. The thought that he was fooling around while Eri was suffering had weighed on his mind for some time. Now that she was Tashinori's problem, he didn't feel nearly as guilty. Seeing no response, even after a full minute had passed, Izuka typed, see you soon, before setting his phone aside. As he did so, the nearby Kirishima asked, Did something good happen? You've got a massive grin on your face. Before Izuku could respond, Kaminari chimed in, noting, I'm surprised he's even here. Weren't you going to fool around with the pussycats? With an annoyed look on his face. He wasn't nearly as bad as Mineta, but as the former's only real friend in the class, Kaminari was the boy with the lowest bond level among those present. I still can, affirmed Izuku. I just thought about what Ida said earlier and figured I should restrain myself since this training camp is a school function. Contrary to what you and Mineta might think, I take my training pretty seriously. Channeling his innate broness, Kirishima added, I'll say, your level is higher than most of the teachers. You must do some pretty crazy training behind the scenes. Adopting a smile, Izuku lied through his teeth asserting, it's thanks to my luck stat. As I mentioned previously, luck is effectively a marker of how talented someone is. With 500 luck, I gained 49x the experience of a normal person with base 10. Scratching his head, Kirishima replied, Now I'm regretting pumping up my other attributes. Eh, it just means you'll need to work a bit harder in the interim, said Izuku. You've seen All Might's level, right? It's still possible to begin investing in luck. More importantly, so long as we're within a kilometer of each other, we share experience. We also earn 10% additional experience for each party member nearby. So you can compensate for your low luck stat by teaming up with Siro, Bakugo, or Todoroki. Hearing his name, Bakugo aggressively asserted, I'm not some bus to help newbies level up. Unless you want to spend your entire life as an extra, find a way to earn experience yourself. Meeting Bakugo's gaze, Izuku retorted, And you wonder why you have such a title? Clicking his tongue, Bakugo surprised Izuku by not exploding. Instead, he offered a curt piss off before pulling out a pair of noise-canceling headphones to listen to his favorite heavy metal band. Someone's growing up, thought Izuku, returning his gaze to Kirishima to say, Don't mind King Boom Boom. I crunched the numbers earlier. And if everyone here were to team up, it would be like we have 392 luck each. With him, it would be like we have 438. That's why the principal wants me to try and recruit as many people as my quirk allows. Experience sharing is completely broken. Drawn to the conversation, Shinso asked, So, you're saying that if I can increase my bond level high enough to join your party, I effectively gain the aptitude of a prodigy? Your quirk is ridiculous. 
Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku replied, My quirk has a lot of potential, but it isn't nearly as ridiculous as the other two actualization quirks. The one wielded by stars and strips allows her to impose rules on herself, her opponents, and her surroundings. Like, she can literally say she's immune to another person's quirk, and it will no longer have any effect on her. My quirk is powerful, but that's just insane. Then what about the one used by Europe's number one hero? Asked Hiroshima. Furrowing his brows slightly, Izuku revealed. Pendragon's quirk is even more ridiculous. Its name has never been publicized, but it allows her to establish a territory, and everything within that territory is basically under her control. The full range of her abilities is unknown, but the effect that pretty much everyone knows about is that she can teleport others freely, be they friend or foe. That sounds really useful, said Siro, joining the conversation along with Tokoyami, Sato, Shoji, Ojiro, and Koda. Mineta also listened in, but he kept to the outskirts, sporting a notably gloomy expression as he used a thumbtack to stab what looked like a hastily made voodoo doll bearing Izuka's name. Less than an hour after he had told her to come over, Izuku received a text from Rumi informing him that she was there. Reading it caused a wry smile to develop across his face as a fierce glimmer flashed across his eyes. Luckily, there were still more than three hours until curfew, so he was able to leave unobstructed, finding the slightly sweaty bunny girl in the midst of talking with Tomoko, Ragdoll, and Yawara Tiger. Spotting Izuku, Rumi promptly ignored Tomoko and Yawara, raising her hand as she said, Yo, you ready to have your butt kicked? Answering in Izuku's stead, Tomoko asserted, You can't just show up like this unannounced, Mirko. You should have at least contacted the principal first. Looking up at the slightly taller cat girl, Rumi raised her brows and asked, Since when did I let others tell me what to do? I'm already here, so if you have a problem, take it up with the principal. But even he won't be able to make me leave. Disengaging from Tomoko and Yawara, Rumi made her way over to Izuku, surprising him by standing on the tips of her toes and planting a brief kiss on his lips. Then, grabbing his collar, she looked over her shoulder, staring at the two pussycats as she said, I'm borrowing this one for a few hours. I heard he skipped out on today's training, so I'm going to help him catch up. We'll be back by sunrise. Punctuating her statement, Rumi promptly threw Izuku over her shoulder before bouncing away like an Amazon fleeing with the spoils of war. The latter wasn't particularly fond of being carried, but he endured it since he wouldn't be the one on the receiving end once Rumi released him. Setting Izuku down a few hundred meters from the lodge, Rumi combed back a few loose strands of hair as she said, It doesn't seem like anyone is following us. With Rumi turning to look up at him with slightly reddened cheeks, Izuku couldn't help adopting a teasing smile as he remarked, I know I told you to come over, but I didn't think you'd get here so fast. Could it be that you want to get pregnant? Furrowing her brows, Rumi wanted to refute Izuku's assertion, but found herself at a momentary loss. As a result, the latter maintained control of the conversation, his eyes narrowing as he instructed, Turn around and stick your jihad out, in a soft but authoritative tone. With Rumi ultimately deciding against revealing her presence to the students of class 1A and 1B, she and Izuku parted ways, the latter rejoining the boys from his class as they prepared for their third day of training. Seeing Izuku enter the room, Kirishima was the first to ask, You good man? You were gone the entire night. As he and Rumi had changed venues quite a few times, Izuku issued a protracted yawn before answering. Since I slacked off during yesterday's training, I was forced to endure remedial lessons all night. I'm good to go though. Catching Izuku a little off guard, Siro adopted his distinctive upside-down triangle of a smile as he teased. So that's what you were doing? Training with this Rumi Yusujiyama woman? Masking his surprise behind a relaxed smile, Izuku responded with an affirming nod, answering, Yeah. She's my training and combat instructor, so we went a few rounds around the mountain. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say, man, teased Siro. However, if he knew the true identity of Rumi Yusujiyama, he might have coughed up blood. 
After all, Izuku was far from the only young man who greatly admired the beautiful, rabbit-eared heroine. There was a reason she was ranked 7 on the Japanese hero billboard charts despite being antisocial and lacking a PR team. She had a lot of fans. After getting changed into his gym clothes, Izuka made his way outside, casually chatting with Kirishima and Shoji until he spotted Achiko, Mina, Toru, Momo, Kyuka, and even Toga standing in a group. Let's talk later, said Izuku. Parting ways with the two boys and intruding on the girls' group, smiling as he mused, You've got bedhead Achiko. Punctuating his words, Izuku smoothed down Achiko's hair as if it was the most natural thing to do. Earning stares from the other girls as Tsuyu remarked, You're becoming bolder, Ribbit. Adopting a broad smile, Izuku replied, Now that our relationship is no longer a secret, I feel free and unrestrained for the first time in months. But don't worry, I might dote on you, but I won't take things too far. Not while we're at school or participating in school functions. On that note, pulling out a piece of black fabric from his pocket, Izuku proffered it to Toga as he said, You shouldn't be sneaking around and breaking school rules, Toga said. Looking away from the familiar piece of fabric, Toga attempted to feign ignorance, asserting, I have no idea what you could possibly be referring to. Shaking his head, Izuku casually replied, There's no sense in trying to deny it. I can ascertain a person's identity with a single glance, even if they're invisible. Besides, if it had Toru who snuck into the boys' changing room, she wouldn't have run away. Hearing Izuku's words, Toru blinked in surprise, turning to Toga to ask, You copied my invisibility quirk? Answering in Toga's stead, Izuku explained, she could temporarily mimic the appearance, quirk, and even the capabilities of anyone whose face she touches with her left hand. The more accurate the copy, the shorter the duration. Losing her usual smile, Toga adopted a narrow-eyed pout, crossing her arms as she asserted, It's not polite to reveal other people's secrets. The same could be said about copying their appearance and abilities without permission, retorted Izuku, adding, if you really want to fit in with everyone, you should be more forthright. Sneaking around behind their backs is a good way to make enemies. Finally, accepting her panties back, Toga maintained a pouty expression as she groused. Then let me join your harem. It's not fair if I'm the only one left out. As he could easily envision Toga emulating the girl's appearances to perform some vengeful acts, Izuku replied, That's up to everyone here. I've already crossed too many lines to feign propriety, so I leave most of the decisions about whether someone can join my harem to them. Prompted by Izuku's words, Momo adopted a faint smile as she revealed, You'll be pleased to know we've already reached a consensus on that matter. So long as you follow the rules we've agreed upon and maintain open communication with everyone in the group, we'll happily welcome you into our fold, Togusan. Hearing Momo's words, a look of abject, slack-jawed disbelief marred Toga's face. She had originally been devastated to learn that Izuku was dating multiple girls, but quickly resolved herself to steal him away. If she had known it was this easy to join his harem, she wouldn't have stressed out so much the previous two days. Adopting a broad, toothy grin that showed off her prominent canines, Toga moved closer to Izuku and said, If that's the case, then let's seal the deal with a kiss. Nodding his head, Izuku replied, I don't mind, but there is a condition I'd like to include. Tilting her head to the side, Toga's smiling expression turned into one of confusion as she asked, What is it? If it's something I can do, I'll do my best to comply. Adopting a serious expression, Izuku explained, Despite involving myself with multiple women, I'm the type that gets jealous easily. I want you to swear never to emulate my appearance or the appearance of another guy to try and trick anyone in our group. Is that all? Asked Toga. If so, then you have nothing to worry about. My quirk is only effective when I transform into girls around my same height and build. It's not impossible for me to transform into a guy, but there are too many anatomical differences to maintain the transformation long term. I have a similar issue when transforming into people with mutant or heteromorphic quirks. It's not impossible, 
but recreating limbs or organs I don't originally possess is difficult. That makes sense. Reply to Zuku, nodding his head before adding. Then my next question is fairly straightforward. Himiko Toga, would you like to join my party? I will if you kiss me, replied Toga, linking her arms around Izuka's neck and dangling from him with a massive grin. Her actions earned her a light chastising from Momo, but she wouldn't have minded a full-blown lecture after Izuku wrapped his hands around her waist and rewarded her with a kiss. Name, Himiko Toga. Title, Mimic Queen. Vitality plus 100 slash copies the effects of other titles when transformed. Quirk, transform. Bond level, 100. Current level, 16. Effective level, 59. Attributes, strength, 25. Agility, 22. Vitality, 235 to 400. Intelligence, 85 to 100. Dexterity, 29. Luck, 205. Free attributes, 0. Perks, healthy body, doppelganger. Lucky girl, doppelganger. The more familiar you are with the target, the longer you can emulate their form and abilities. Lucky girl. Physical attributes are temporarily boosted by 10% after intercourse. The effect increases by 5% for each successive coupling, capping at 50%. While everyone else was conducting intense training to improve their quirks, Izuku was pulled aside by Ryuko, moving well beyond the one-kilometer experience sharing range of the rest of the class to meet up with the former's favorite rabbit. Before separating earlier that morning, Izuku asked Rumi if she would help him conduct some experiments with the experience-sharing feature. His plan was to re-roll most of his attributes into luck, effectively giving himself and everyone present 667 luck. Then, while he performed basic exercises off to the side, Rumi could thrash Ryuko's Earth Beast to help him grind experience. Unfortunately, while Rumi earned around 6,000 experience from defeating Ryuko's Earth Beasts, she was the only one to gain experience. Izuku had anticipated this since he got no experience when accompanying Tashinori to destroy some robots, but his experiments with Rumi and Ryuko allowed him to confirm there was an experience-sharing range, not simply in terms of distance, but level. Fortunately, as their levels were only one apart, Izuku could share experience with Ryuko. His effectual luck decreased from 796 to 537 since their luck values were merged, divided by 2, and then multiplied by 1.2, but he didn't mind. The more powerful Ryuko became, the more experience points her Earth Beasts awarded. In other words, by training together, their experience scaled infinitely, limited only by Ryuko's ability to produce a finite amount of Earth Beasts. Since Ryuko couldn't gain experience from defeating her creations, and the experience decreased if they just sat still, Izuka spent much of the third day of the training camp battling as if his life depended on it. Fortunately, while Ryuko's soil compression made her earth beasts a lot tougher, Izuku could slice through and tear them apart using Black Whip. As a result, he was able to take out more than 300 earth beasts by the time lunch came around, netting himself and Ryuko more than 1.4M experience at the cost of being battered and covered in dirt. You look like crap, remarked Rumi, undermining the massive grin on her face. She enjoyed seeing Izuku a bit worse for wear, but as she was no longer able to bully him like she used to, it felt cathartic seeing someone else take up the task. Eh, I think he looks pretty good, mused Ryuko, making a scratching motion with her paw-like glove, pulling most of the dirt and grime from Izuka's body as she added. Now he looks even better to clicking her tongue. Rumi pulled up the party window to see if Izuku or Ryuko had leveled up. The experience between levels in the 40s was a mere 1 million points, so Izuku was on the cusp of a second level while Ryuko's had increased twice. Not bad for seven and a half hours of work, remarked Rumi. Then, with a teasing smile, she looked to Ryuko and added, Your quirk is pretty suited to this, dirt cat. Licking her lips, Ryuko narrowed her eyes and made a grabbing gesture at Izuku as she replied, 
Izuku and I have always had amazing compatibility. If he weren't a stickler for the rules, I'd have sunk my teeth and claws into him. Before anyone else? Snorting through her nose, Rumi remarked. You should consider yourself lucky. Even if you had teamed up with the other hag cats, the three of you wouldn't have lasted more than a week against this brat's libido. He shot it out more than 30 times just last night. Instead of looking even remotely intimidated, Ryuko covered the lower half of her face with her paws, eyes glistening as she writhed about, and exclaimed, Such virility. It's no wonder Mandalay was behaving like a love-struck maiden last night. You must have really messed her up, meow, meow, meow. Shaking his head, Izuka casually responded, I was actually really gentle. She knows a surprisingly submissive woman in the bedroom, so I didn't have the heart to treat her roughly. Nodding her head, Ryuko remarked, I can see that. She's always been the big sister of our group, doing her best to behave responsibly and bear everyone's burdens. But she becomes docile and enjoys being pampered once you get a few drinks in her. Did you give her tummy rubs? She really likes them. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku. Then, as Ryuko had shed her gloves and was in the process of removing her skirt, he adopted a wry smile and asked, I take it we're done training for the day? Letting her skirt plop to the ground, revealing white panties with a cat-like paw print on the front, Ryuko narrowed her eyes as she replied, I've been waiting 31 years for this day. Take off your pants. Though she was one of the more aggressive and hyperactive among the pussycats, Ryuko was the only one who had yet to shaboink in their entire group. She took being an idol seriously, and because of her fondness for younger, exceptionally talented boys, she had never found a partner that matched her preferences half as much as Izuku. Then I'm going to head out, said Rumi, feeling aroused but not wanting to share Izuku with another woman. Directing her gaze to Izuku, Rumi added, I'll see you at Okinoshima next week. Don't keep me waiting. Finished with what she had to say, Rumi leaped high into the sky, easily ascending more than a hundred meters before kicking the air with enough force to propel herself horizontally through the air. She wasn't capable of true flight, but so long as she had strength in her thighs, she could remain airborne. There she goes, muttered Ryuko. Then, like a cat pouncing on a mouse, she abruptly jumped on Izuku, inadvertently triggering his tripping perk. As a result, she somehow found her face buried into his crotch, Izuka's nose pressing into her own after a very comical tumble. Well, that's convenient, mused Ryuko, pulling down Izuka's gym pants and smiling even wider when she saw his fully macho meat grinder. Licking her lips, Ryuko chimed, Itata Kimisu, before unhesitantly taking Izuka's meat grinder into her mouth, licking up and down his shaft as she wagged her rear from side to side. Interrupting Izuku's and Ryuko's nap, Tomoko, using her search quirk, tracked them down, touching the tip of her lips with the nail of her paw-like gloves and staring at them wide-eyed when she found them cuddling atop a bed of their clothes. The two of you look like you had a lot of fun, remarked Tomoko, her peculiar yellow eyes zeroing in on Izuka's meat grinder, widening quite a bit as she added, Oh wow, you're around the same size as Yuara, and has cost a small fortune. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, What are you talking about? While helping Ryuko gather her clothes. Blinking in surprise, Ryuko asked, Did Shino not tell you? Yuara was born a girl, but underwent a special procedure in Thailand to become a man. There's a famous doctor there that can swap people's genders and modify their appearances. Nodding her head, Tomoko added, His services are expensive, but he's good at what he does. Before his transformation, Yuer was only around 155 centimeters and weighed around 47 kilograms. Afterward, he shot up to 190 centimeters and is currently around 130 kilograms. If you saw his before and after pictures, you'd be really surprised. Recovering from his momentary stupor, Izuku adopted a wry smile as he remarked, I'll have to let Mineta from my class know. If that doctor can give a presumably cute girl the physique of a male bodybuilder, he might be able to remedy Mineta's vertical deficit. It's not impossible, 
replied Ryuko. But we had to save up for years to afford you ours transition. It cost us around 3 million more than 10 years ago, so I imagine the price has shot up tremendously since then. Though he didn't know how bot converted into yen, Izuka shrugged, revealing, I won't disclose how much money I have, but you girls won't ever have to worry about finances. The markets have been crashing due to the NWT phenomenon, but the yen is one of the world's three reserve currencies. Narrowing her eyes and licking her lips, Ryuko suddenly felt like going another ten rounds as she snuggled up to Izuku and mused, If that's the case, I don't have to hold anything back. I was worried we might place a burden on you, if we all had kittens around the same time, but if you're as wealthy as you claim to be, pushing Izuku to the ground. Ryuko attempted to straddle and mount him before Tomoko gave her Jiet a firm smack, saying, We need to head back to the lodge. The students will be starting their test of courage soon, and we need you there. Clicking her tongue, Ryuko rubbed the visible handprint on her rear as she replied, Okay, mom. Then, just as Tomoko lowered her guard, Ryuko's blue eyes flashed, her form appearing to blue for a brief moment as she appeared behind the slightly shorter, green-haired girl, groping her vigorously as she teased. Who do you think you're kidding with that calm expression of yours? I know you're just as aroused as I am. Instead of refuting Ryuko's words, Tomoko grabbed the former's hands, frowning as she exclaimed, It doesn't matter. We have a job to do. And if we can't do it properly, the principal will lecture us. Freeing herself from Ryuko's clutches, Tomoko attempted to create some distance between them. But, despite having outstanding balance and cat-like reflexes, she somehow ended up tripping over her own feet nearly face-planting into Izuka's still undressed crotch, but arresting her momentum just as her lips kissed the tip of his meat grinder. With the test of courage requiring students to navigate a dark forest path in groups of two, Izuka took advantage of the fact his class had an odd number of participants to nominate himself as a scarer. However, instead of actively participating in the event, he accompanied Tomoko to the far side of the course, watching over her as she watched over everyone with her search quirk. Seated in a tree and dangling her legs restlessly, Tomoko asked, So, what do you think might happen? Or, was that just an excuse to get me alone? I wish, replied Izuku, standing on the opposite side of the tree with his back to it, arms crossed. His memories of the cannon were hazy, but one of the events he remembered clearly was Tomoko getting severely injured, abducted, and having her quirk stolen during the League of Villains night raid. There was a fair chance the night raid wouldn't occur, as all for one seemed to be preparing for the MWD phenomenon, but it was better to be safe than sorry. Falling backward and dangling from her tree branch upside down, Tomoko noticed that Izuka had a severe expression, eyes closed as he focused on listening to their surroundings. She thought he had just wanted to flirt and fool around a bit, but he appeared to be pretty serious, Sensing Tomoko's movements, Izuku opened his eyes, looking up slightly to find the green-haired girl staring at him with her almost perfectly round eyes. It was a little creepy, especially with her eyes emitting a faint yellow glow, but he managed to smile, nearly causing her to fall out of the tree as he teased. Thinking about the taste of my meat grinder? Releasing her legs and flipping on her feet, Tomoko looked up at Izuku and remarked, and here I thought you were the super serious type while on duty. Then, while getting very close to Izuku, close enough that her fairly modest melons were pressed against him, she added, You're really handsome, Midoriya-kun. Like, super duper handsome. With Tomoko staring at him unblinkingly, an expectant look on her face, a faint smile developed across Izuku's as he replied, You're really cute as well. Tomoko. Also, call me Izuku from now on. Swaying her head from side to side like a metronome, Tomoko inspected Izuka's face as she asked, Are you saying that it make me happy? Or do you really mean it? Most people get really unnerved by how big and round my eyes are. My quirk also enhances my vision, so I can see in the dark clear enough to make out the pores on a person's face. Raising his brows, Izuka asked, Are you testing me? Before surprising Tomoko, quite a bit as he picked her up by the pits of her arms, adding, 
Put your legs and arms around me. Though she swallowed audibly, Tomoko did as Izuku instructed, allowing him to move his hands to her, but as he added, First of all, I find you very charming. Your eyes don't bother me in the slightest. Rather, if you look at the girls in my entourage, you'll notice quite a few have large or peculiar eyes. I personally find them very attractive. Swallowing a second time, Tomoko meekly reminded, We're on duty right now. Nodding in affirmation, Izuka's voice softened and became deeper as he replied, You're right, but since you seem uncertain, allow me to allay your concerns. Just a bit. Punctuating his words, Izuku pressed his lips to Tomoko's, surprising her quite a bit despite easing into things slowly. However, since her eyes were already open to their limits, her expression didn't appear to change in the slightest. Instead, she briefly became statuesque before gradually closing her eyes, tightening her hold around Izuka's neck as she enjoyed her first kiss, at least with a guy, in more than seven years. It was a lot better than she remembered, with Class 1A finishing their test of courage, swapping places with 1B, and more than three hours passing, Izuka's alertness began to wane. He didn't drop his guard, but with Tomoko sitting in his lap, resting her head against his chest as he combed his fingers through her hair, he felt calm and relaxed. Looks like the League of Villains isn't a thing in this universe, at least not publicly, thought Izuku. Similar thoughts had crossed his mind when Ida's brother wasn't crippled, but the distinct lack of Noma-based attacks pretty much confirmed that All for One was amassing his forces, building an army in secret. Shifting his gaze skyward, Izuka's intuition was triggered by the notion that Shigaraki would receive the All for One surgery before their next encounter. Unfortunately, he had only seen up to season 5 of the anime, never read the manga, nor watched any of the movies. He knew Shigaraki had become ridiculously OP based on some YouTube videos he had seen, but he was unfamiliar with the circumstances surrounding the change. All he knew for certain was that Mirko had risked life and limb to interrupt his transformation before it could be completed. Imagining his favorite rabbit losing one of her beautiful arms and legs, Izuku's expression soured. Rumi had become more conscientious after having her intelligence increased but her core nature hadn't changed. If push came to shove, she would push harder than just about anyone else, charging forward like a berserker even with all her limbs cut off. Sensing the change in Izuka's mood, Tomoko raised her head from his chest, looking up at him with her piercing yellow eyes as she asked, Did you sense something? Shaking his head, Izuka replied the opposite. There's so little going on that I'm slowly becoming complacent. Cuddling with you like this is very relaxing, almost therapeutic, so my thoughts are beginning to wander. Adopting a broad, visibly gratified smile, Tomoko revealed, Well, the test of courage is just about over. The last pair should reach the halfway mark in 5 minutes, so we can start heading back in 10 to 15. Gaining a smile of his own, Izuku brought his face closer to Tomoko's as he replied, 15 it is before taking the initiative to start making out a second time. After legitimately exhausting himself throughout the day, Izuka sank into the water up to his chin when it came time to bathe. Fortunately, none of the guys in his party suspected he had spent the day fooling around since an increase of two levels was fairly noteworthy. Instead, Kirishima asked, You okay, man? You look beat. With nearly everyone in that bath looking over in response to Kirishima's statement, Izuku lazily replied, I spent the day fighting against hundreds of those magical beasts. I didn't even eat lunch or dinner, so my vitality hasn't had a chance to recover. Magical beasts? Do you mean those things that attacked us on the first day? Asked Kirishima. If so, you're a beast, man. I can take out one or two pretty easily, but hundreds? Jeez. It was worth it, though, replied Izuku. Since Pixie Bob is in the party, we were able to experiment with experience sharing. Now that we have a better understanding of how it works, everyone in the party will probably be doing some joint experience grinding in the future. Hearing Izuku's words, most of the boys present, especially those in his party, gained anticipatory looks. One of the few exceptions was Mineta, 
who, as usual, could only think about girls. Thus, shortly after Izuku had finished speaking, he groaned, What's the point? You stole all the girls in class, and have even extended your clutches to the teachers. At this rate, you'll even steal the girls from class 1B. Furrowing his brows, Izuku rose to a seated position, meeting the purple-haired youth's resent-filled gaze as he retorted, Even if I didn't, none of them would date someone as petty and vindictive as you. I was going to recommend a doctor that could help alter your appearance and increase your height, but now I feel like a fool for ever concerning myself with your future. You genuinely don't give two shits about becoming a real hero, do you? All you think about is girls, girls, girls. Even though you haven't done a damn thing to deserve their care or affection. Adopting an aggrieved, teary-eyed look, Mineta exclaimed. You're just lucky you were born handsome and attained a powerful quirk. Without them, you'd be less than dog crap. Without waiting for Izuku's response, Mineta, once again, ran from the bath with tears streaming down his face. This time, however, Izuka didn't feel an iota of sympathy for him. Instead, he thought, now I know how the principal was planning to fit Bakugo and Toga into our class. There's no way this little shit is sticking around. Though it was possible to expand their sizes, the current department of Heroics classrooms could only seat 20 students. Aoyama appeared to have been dealt with, but that only produced a single vacancy. There was a chance that Nizu was banking on Izuka passing his CBEs, meaning his desk would no longer be occupied, but now that he had been greenlit to invite everyone to his party, someone like Mineta had no place in the hero course. Similar to the previous day, Izuka's fourth day of training was set to revolve around fighting earth beasts produced by Ryuko. The difference was that Rumi wasn't there waiting for them when they arrived. Instead, it was just him and Ryuko alone, prompting the latter to pounce on him the moment they reached their destination. Fortunately, though he wasn't able to prevent Ryuko from stealing his lips and grinding against him vigorously, Izuka managed to talk her out of an early morning shabo-inking. He truthfully didn't mind. But, as their reason for being there was to train, he asked her to stay focused until they gained at least a single level. Undoubtedly, as a result of her frustration, Ryuko's Earth Beasts were a lot stronger and faster than they were the previous day. This increased the amount of experience they awarded, but Izuka found himself on the back foot in multiple instances as Ryuko mixed things up by shifting the terrain around and creating traps. Izuka got even with her later on, but he was fairly certain that's what Ryuko wanted, as she giggled like an idiot after he shabbowinked her silly. Unable to sleep properly the previous night, Rumi, wearing a face mask and a hat that concealed her ears, paid a visit to a private heteromorphic doctor who specialized in determining whether a couple's quirks and physiologies were compatible. The panda-headed woman was very surprised when she found out her client was Rabbit Hero Mirko, but she remained professional and readily analyzed the genetic sample Rumi had brought with her. Allaying Rumi's concerns, the panda-headed woman stared wide-eyed at the test results, genuine disbelief marring her face as she remarked, This sample is incredible. Not only is it compatible with your genetic makeup, but I dare say it's compatible with just about anyone. In my 27 years as a geneticist, I have never seen such adaptive genes. They're like supercharged stem cells. Then we have nothing else to discuss, said Rumi, rising to her feet and pulling out her cell phone to contact Nizu. He had asked her to report any important discoveries related to Izuku, and this seemed like fairly critical information. If so, it would need to be covered up as quickly as possible. With the final three days of the training camp being a survival exercise in the forest of magical beasts, Izuku found himself as the only student in the lodge. His participation in the exercise would invalidate the difficulty and turn it into a grinding session. So he spent most of the day chatting or playing shogi with Kan, the homeroom teacher of Class 1B. The man was a bit of a prude, resulting in him having a bond level of 58, but Izuku was able to improve it to 71 by the end of the training camp. Speaking of bond levels, Izuka managed to get each member of the wild, wild pussycats, to 100. Interacting and sparring with Yawara made him a little uncomfortable, 
But as he would eventually be knocking up all of the transgender man's friends, Izuka did his best to get along with the inordinately lithe and muscular Catboy. Fortunately for Izuku, Shino, Ryuko, and Tomoko greatly appreciated his efforts to get along with Yuara. One of the biggest factors behind their inability to find a suitable mate was that most guys couldn't stand to be around their admittedly intimidating companion. As a result, Izuku earned a considerable amount of gratitude from the three cat-like girls. Tomoko, Yuara's best friend, was especially grateful, so much so that she snuck into Izuku's room the evening of the sixth day to do some night crawling. With only a few hours remaining until the end of the survival training, Izuku was eating lunch with Shino, Ryuko, Tomoko, and Yawara, initially making light conversation until Ryuko asked, So, when are you planning to breed us? There are at most six months until the MWT phenomenon reaches Japan. It'll take a few more for the breaches to get out of hand. So now is the best time, unless you plan to wait until after graduation or whatever. I mean, I have been loading inside each of you, replied Izuku. At this point, I'm proceeding with the mentality of if it happens, it happens. My Kachan will probably freak out when it does, but she would benefit from having grandchildren around the house. Narrowing her eyes and adopting a catty smile, Ryuko asked, Does that mean it's okay if we get ahead of Mirko? I could feel her staring daggers at me while you and I were training together. Looking up slightly, Izuku adopted an overtly thoughtful look, seriously considering his response before answering. If I had to choose, I would prefer it if Rumi got pregnant first. If things hadn't developed in this weird direction, I think the two of us could have been happy together. Blinking in surprise, Tomoko asked, Do you luove Mirko? With a wide-eyed smile, emphasizing the word love. Shaking his head, Izuku adopted a self-deprecating smile as he replied, at this point, I don't have a lot of leeway to speak about things like love. All I can say for certain is that every moment we're together feels more meaningful than the last. Covering her mouth with her hands, Ryuko exclaimed, Oh my! While Shino, Tomoko, and Yuwara stared at Izuku with appreciative smiles, the latter asking, What is that if not love? Nodding in affirmation, Shino asserted, it's unquestionably love. That said, the three of us will restrain ourselves until Mirko is confirmed to be pregnant. Just try to get it done before the end of summer break. We'll be staying at UA once the second term begins, and I doubt this blonde idiot will be able to control herself with the two of you grinding experience all the time. Instead of trying to refute Shino's words, Ryuko replied, She's right. The principal has arranged to have me power level you, so we'll be spending virtually every day together, at least when you're not participating in work studies. Licking her lips, Ryuko looked like she was ready to pounce on Izuka then and there. Instead, she restrained her more animalistic urges after a light swat from Shino. From there, the conversation abruptly shifted to Izuka's mother. Unlike Rumi, the pussycats were a little worried about how Inko would respond to the knowledge they would be having as children. Ryuko wasn't, but Shino and Tomoko at least pretended to care, with Ryuko controlling the Earth Beast to be more active at night. The students of classes 1A and 1B arrived at the Forest Lodge, looking a bit worse for wear. Even Bakugo looked like he hadn't slept the entire three days, his expression rivaling Aizawa's apathy, while his teammates, Tsuyu, Koda, and Siro looked like they could barely keep their eyes open. Fortunately, unlike the previous few days, when they had been forced to prepare food for themselves, Ryuko waited until everyone was gathered before clapping her paw-covered hands together and exclaiming, Good job, everyone! Now that you've all returned, this year's summer training camp has officially ended. As a reward, we've prepared a sumptuous feast to fill your bellies. The baths will also be available to both classes until 10 p.m., so feel free to cut loose, relax, and get to know each other. You've certainly earned it. Hearing that a feast awaited them, the members of Class 1A and 1B had new life breathed into them. Most of the girls immediately made their way to the baths, prioritizing getting cleaned up 
while the vast majority of the boys engorge themselves upon the buffet-like feast awaiting them in the lounge area. Unlike most of the boys, Mineta elected to take a bath first. Unfortunately for him, Izuka warned the girls he wouldn't be on Overwatch that evening, so Momo passed out swimsuits to everyone. Thus, when Mineta inevitably scaled the wooden partition to peek, what awaited him was a bunch of girls lounging about and chatting in their swimsuits. It was still a heavenly sight, but nowhere near the nirvana he expected to find. At the very least, it wasn't worth the subsequent, this time final expulsion that followed the girls' combined SA complaint. August 5th, 2149, after one final night in the Force Lodge, the students of classes 1A and 1B were ferried back to UA. There, they were informed that the school would implement a dorm system starting at the beginning of the second term. So everyone was given a form to take home and show their parents. The dorms had already been constructed, so they had from that moment until the end of summer break to move their stuff and get situated in their new rooms. Though he was invited by most of his classmates to go and check out the dorms together, Izuka declined since, as usual, the principal asked to see him the moment he arrived on campus. Thus, while nearly everyone else made their way to the new dorms, Izuku followed an increasingly familiar route, navigating several hallways and taking an elevator to the principal's office. Noticing the mild frustration behind Izuku's forced smile, Nizu exhaled a light chuckle before asking, Have I inconvenienced you by calling you to my office? A little, replied Izuku. But considering all the favors you've done for me in the past, I have no intention of complaining. Nodding his head, Nizu mused, that's excellent to hear, as, in a way, this is also related to me doing you a favor. Before Izuku could ask what he was talking about, Nizu slid what looked like a paper-sized piece of glass toward him. When Izuku picked it up, the surface came to life like a transparent tablet, showing a picture of a young girl with pale, gray-blue hair in the left-hand corner and a bunch of medical and identifying information on the right. Immediately recognizing the girl, Izuka's expression became a lot more serious as he muttered, Eri Chisaki, while scanning and committing the information on the panel to memory. Seeing Izuku abruptly frown, Nizu assumed he had reached the point of her information pertaining to her family and background, stating, that's right. Contrasting our expectations, little Miss Chisaki was not being kept and experimented upon as your vision predicted. She was living with her biological grandfather after her birth mother abandoned her. Instead of doubting the credibility of Izuka's vision, as he had predicted many things with remarkable accuracy, Nizu added, We believe that, much like Sir Naitai's foresight, what you witnessed was a vision of the future, a series of events that had yet to come to pass. Fortunately, there was more than enough evidence in their underground compound to detain and incarcerate Overhaul and his associates. Barring certain concessions, they will spend a very long time in prison. Setting down the futuristic glass tablet on Nizu's mahogany desk, Izuku's expression hardened as he asked, You made an agreement with them? Following a light chuckle, Nizu nodded his head, adopting a faint smile as he explained, The president of the Shai Hasekai regards Overhaul, true name Kaichisaki, as his son and successor. In exchange for the latter's pardon, he has agreed to relocate his organization and has entrusted his granddaughter to our care. However, whether we accept his terms is up to you. Nearly as soon as Nizu was finished speaking, the door to his office opened, followed by Namuri coming inside, leading a timid-looking girl with a red smock-like dress by hand. Name, Eretiseki. Title, Telanius Key. Bond plus 50, Vitality plus 500. Quirk, State Manipulation, Bond Level, 100. 50 Base, 50 from Title. Current Level, 3. Effective Level, 76. Attributes, Strength, 3. Agility, 4. Vitality, 721. Intelligence, 26. Dexterity, 5. Luck, 3. Free Attributes, 15. Perks, Telania's Key. Though she looked incredibly nervous upon first stepping into the room, 
Eri appeared to enter a daze when she met Izuka's gaze. The latter also had a look of disbelief on his face. Not just because Eri already had a title and perk, but because the information related to her quirk was insane. As ludicrous as it sounded, Eri could revert a person's body to a previous state, even if they were long deceased. Doing so consumed her life force, meaning it permanently decreased her vitality, but she also stockpiled vitality over time, gathering it within her horn. Right now, it was barely a nub above her right eye, protruding from the base of her hairline, but as the amount of vitality she had stockpiled increased, it would grow larger, eventually reaching a point where she could no longer control the energy and had to release it. Wait, if she is constantly stockpiling vitality, doesn't that make her immortal? Thought is Zuku. She can also restore people to their prime and resurrect the dead. She's like a living, breathing fountain of youth. Imagining the lengths some would go to to get their hands on Eri's power, Izuka's expression became increasingly severe. Her title, Telania's Key, also implied she had a very important role to play. So even though he felt Nizu had crossed multiple lines, he knew he had to protect the little girl staring at him as though she had just met her idol. Breaking Izuku from his reverie, Eri surprised him by exclaiming, You're Izuka Midoriya. I saw you on the TV. You're super amazing, with a broad, almost luminous smile on her face. Covering her mouth, Namuri narrowed her eyes and playfully mused. Oh my, looks like someone has a fan. Adopting a wry smile, Izuku extended his right pinky as he replied. It's nice to meet you, Eri. Grasping Izuka's pinky excitedly, Eri looked like she was about to explode from happiness until Niza chimed in to say, Allow me to welcome you to my office, Chisaki-chan. My name is Dash. Opening her eyes wider than when she saw Izuku, Eri abruptly released the former's finger, exclaiming, That stuffed animal is talking. That's so cool. With shimmering red eyes akin to a child on Christmas morning, with Namuri eventually removing Eri from the room, leaving Izuku alone with Nizu, the latter asked, So, how is she? Though I already have a fairly good idea based on your reaction. Her quirk is even more ridiculous than I expected, replied Izuku. It consumes her vitality, but she can even resurrect the recently deceased. More importantly, she possesses a title similar to mine, called Telania's Key. As he had already informed Nizu of his Telania's champion title, Izuku had no qualms about revealing Ares. Rather, by doing so, he effectively confirmed that Eri was special and that both of them had a role to play in surmounting the MWT phenomenon. Nodding his head, Nizu responded with a thoughtful, I see, before swiveling his chair to the side and asking, Then what would you like to do, Midoriya Kuen? At present, I have delegated little Ms. Chisaki's care to Kiyama-san. Shall I have her move to your residence, entrusting her to you and your mother? Furrowing his brows, Izuku replied, I'm not sure that's the best course of action. This whole situation strikes me as unethical. However, considering what's at stake, we can't return her to her grandfather and allow her to be raised by criminals. If they discover the true nature of her power, it would be an unmitigated disaster. Then let's do this, said Nizu, turning back to Izuku as he added. We'll leave her in the care of Kiyama-san and Chiyo-sensei, recovery girl. Ms. Chisaki's power could make her the most extraordinary healer this world has ever known, and depending on the circumstances, she may be able to use it to revitalize Chiyo-sensei. Quirks that influence the healing process of others are exceptionally rare, so we can't afford to lose recovery girl at this pivotal moment. Since he was reluctant to raise his own children, at least directly, Izuko didn't hesitate to nod in response to Nizu's proposal, answering, That's probably for the best. I can assist in her training and will give my all to protect her, but I can't be her primary or secondary caretaker. Returning a nod of his own, Nizu mused, Understandable. However, as there is unquestionably a connection between the two of you, expect to spend a fair amount of time with her. If you are the hero fated to save this world, Little Miss Chisaki may be the saintess blessed by the gods to support you. 
Raising his brows, Izuku asked, Have you been studying RPGs and video game terminology? With the world veering in a direction where people fight monsters, level up, and track their growth via status windows, it would be remiss of me not to, replied Nizu. Speaking of which, how's my bond level looking? I trust it has improved, at least a little. Nodding in affirmation, Izuku revealed, it's currently sitting at 73. I'm not sure what you're doing to increase it, but it appears to be working. Adopting a broad smile, Nizu mused, I'm looking forward to it. I may be one of the most intelligent creatures in the world, but being stuck at level 8 won't do me any favors in the world to come. When people can quantify their power, using levels a hierarchy surrounding them is bound to form. In Europe, they're already starting to classify people with grades ranging from F to SSS. That doesn't surprise me, replied Izuku, shaking his head as he added. Well, with Tashinori Kun around, we shouldn't have to worry too much about supremacists appearing. Our biggest concern should be our mutual enemy and that man with the decay quirk. A power like that makes levels inconsequential. The same can be said for Little Miss Chisaki, asserted Nizu. But, like her, there must be a restriction to Tenko Kuen's power. Once we figure that out, counteracting his power shouldn't be too difficult. I'm far more concerned with our mutual enemy. If he times his return well and chooses to play the part of a savior, we may not be able to act against him publicly. Humans are quick to rally behind those with power, especially if they believe it will increase their chances of survival. Preempting Izuku's response, Niza shook his head, regaining a smile as he added, This is a matter for another time. You already have enough on your plate, so allow me to release you so you can relish the remainder of your summer break. To that end, I wish you and yusajiyama san the best of luck. Returning a wry smile, Izuku rose to his feet, offering a customary bow before excusing himself from Nizu's office. He was tempted to say he didn't need luck, but with how rapidly things were developing, he wouldn't mind having fate on his side. Assuming everyone would still be checking out the dorms, Izuku made his way to the hotel-like building allocated to Class 1A, Heights Alliance. Like the other mass-produced dorms forming a row behind UA's main building, it was a large building with five stories separated into two wings. A neatly trimmed hedge circled the entire building, leaving a small gap at the front that led to the entrance, a set of large, heavily fortified double doors. Two park benches and a pair of street lamps adorned the short path, while the building itself had a predominantly white base while the upper levels were colored brown, at least from the outside. Entering the dorm's first floor, Izuka felt as though he was stepping into a fairly high-class hotel as there was a spacious lounge area outfitted with comfortable-looking furniture, a massive television, cafe-style tables, a large kitchen, gender-specific baths, and a large laundry room with state-of-the-art washers and dryers. There was also a courtyard roughly the size of a basketball court, complete with a control panel that caused hoops to come down from the ceiling or a tennis net to rise from the floor. Finding no one on the first floor, Izuka made his way over to the security monitor, placing his handprint on the scanner to pull up a list of the dorm rooms, revealing the location of his designated dorm and allowing him to see which were currently occupied. Seeing where his room was located, a wry smile developed across Izuka's face as he muttered, That damn principal. While the other student dorms separated boys and girls between the left and right wings, things were different for Class 1A. Most of the boys had been consolidated on the second and third floors, leaving the fourth for the girls, while Izuku was the sole person on the fifth. More notably, the floor had been converted into a single contiguous living space, effectively making it a private suite for Izuka's personal use. Though he certainly appreciated having a large space to himself, Izuka couldn't help feeling that Nizu was being a little too preferential toward him. He understood the diminutive Chimera's reasoning and was thankful for Nizu's consideration. But things were bound to get awkward when his male classmates invariably used the proximity function to discover one or more of their female classmates in the same location as him. Unfortunately, while it was possible to disable the proximity function in the party settings window, Izuku couldn't conceal individual locations. 
it was either on or off. So unless he wanted to disable it completely, he had to live with the fact that the people within his party would know when he was shadowinking or simply hanging out with other members. The only other option was temporarily kicking people from his party, but Izuku had tried that in the past, confirming it prevented the expelled member from seeing their status and benefiting from the perks they had received as a result of his digitalization quirk. It was an effective anti-betrayal measure, so Izuku intended to keep it a secret until he was forced to reveal it. Though they were originally having fun decorating their rooms with the help of Momo's creation quirk, all the girls chose to accompany Izuku when he made his way up to the fifth floor to see the accommodations Nizu had made for him, or more accurately, all of them. The leftmost wing was a fairly ordinary living space, having a lounge area, a kitchen, a dining area, and a bedroom outfitted with a massive, nearly 5x5 in bed, but the right wing was, for lack of a better descriptive, ridiculous. Upon entering the right wing, Izuku and the girls found themselves in a workshop outfitted with borderline sci-fi fabrication facilities provided as a courtesy of David Shield. Beyond that, they needed to pass through a full-body scanner and decontamination chamber before accessing what appeared to be a clean room used for medical procedures. Even further beyond, they found an actual hospital room before reaching the deepest section of the wing, what Izuku initially believed to be a safe room, but in actuality turned out to be a fully furnished Shiboink dungeon with a secret hatch connecting to empty rooms on the fourth, third, and second floors. Though Mina... Toru, and especially Togo were eager to christen Izuka's newly acquired Shiboink dungeon. He managed to talk them out of it as they all needed to head home and prepare for their extended stay at Okinoshima. Toga had yet to receive permission, but she was confident she would be able to join them after a few days, using the excuse she wanted to move into her dorm room as soon as possible. She had already been approved as a member of Class 1A even before the summer training camp began so she had a room between Momo's and Achiko's on the fourth floor. After seeing the girls off in the early afternoon, Izuku made his way home, eager to see his mom and check on Melissa's progress. He wasn't looking forward to apprising Inko of his plans to knock up multiple women, but he knew it would be pretty messed up to conceal things until she abruptly had a bunch of brats calling her Obachan. With such thoughts in mind, Izuku initially entered his former workshop, finding it empty. However, as Melissa had been pretty busy upgrading the school's security, he wasn't particularly surprised to find her absent. She was an official employee of UA, so she had obligations other than making his whims a reality. Entering his house through the reinforced security door, separating it from the workshop, Izuku called out, Kachan, I'm home, in a loud, booming voice. Shortly after that, Inko appeared at the top of the stairs, wearing a sleeveless tank top that exposed her stomach and what looked like black, form-fitting bike shorts. Smiling broadly, Inko happily chimed, Welcome home, sweetie, before hurrying down the stairs to give Izuku a firm, lasting, and incredibly warm hug. Raising his brows, Izuku reciprocated Inko's embrace while asking, Did you just get back from the gym? Looking up to meet Izuku's gaze, Inko's smile became somewhat wry as she replied, not exactly. I did go to the gym this morning, but I've been exercising in my room for the past hour or two. Why do I smell bad? Shaking his head, Izuku replied, You smell fine. I was just curious since you're sweating a bit, and your body feels incredibly warm. If you hadn't been exercising, I would have been concerned that you were sick. Turning her eyes up slightly, Inko, with her arms still linked around Izuku's body, replied, Thanks to that healthy body perk of yours, I never get sick anymore. Then, demonstrating her unique form of intuition and the fact she could see through him like a pane of glass, she asked, So, what's got you in such a serious mood? Am I going to become a grandmother? With Inko hitting the nail on the head, the smile on Izuka's face visibly cramped. In response, the petite, green-haired woman exhaled a tired sigh, releasing her hold on his body as she said, Go and take a seat in the living room. I'll prepare tea and then you can tell me all about it. Without waiting for Izuku to respond, Inko sauntered away, taking slow and deliberate steps as she made her way to the kitchen. Izuku's gaze nearly lowered by instinct, but having resolved himself to take things a little more seriously after the revelation that he loved Rumi, he managed to keep his eyes straight ahead as he followed behind and made his way to the living room. 
though she wasn't very happy about it. Inko wasn't surprised to learn that Izuku and Rumi were trying for a baby. She was, however, surprised to learn he would be doing the same with three, even older women. While massaging her forehead, Inko exhaled a sigh and muttered, What am I going to do with you? Adopting a wry smile, Izuku replied, It's not that bad. I have more than enough money. And Dash shaking her head, Inko cut Izuku off, stating, It's not about the money, Izuku. The problem is you being willing to impregnate women you barely know and seeing nothing wrong with it. As it wasn't like he couldn't see where Inko was coming from. The smile faded from Izuku's face as he hung his head, feeling at least a marginal amount of shame. He knew better than anyone how irresponsible he was being. But since he also knew what was at stake if he failed, he was doing his best to live a life without regrets. Seeing Izuku's conscience-stricken expression, Inko softened as she said, It's okay, Izuku. I know you have a strong sense of responsibility and feel compelled to help others. I'm not going to stop you if this is something you truly desire, but if you're only doing it because you feel obliged in some way, please reconsider. I don't want to see you or your children hurt if things don't work out the way you expect. Ka-chan, raising his face, Izuka's throat tightened as he met the concerned and loving gaze of Inko. Even at a glance, he could tell she loved him even more than she loved herself. This was the main reason he had never been able to cross the line with her, as, even now, he couldn't understand how anyone could care for another so deeply. That, and the fact she was the only mother he had ever known across both his lives. Turning her eyes up and adopting a helpless smile, Inko extended her arms to Izuku, saying, Come here, in a gentle tone that paradoxically left no room for discussion. What followed was Inko holding Izuku in her embrace. He was much, much bigger than she was. But for the briefest of moments, Izuku's sentiments overlapped with Deka's, making him feel like a small child once again. For the first time in quite a while, Izuku found himself staring at his ceiling with a listless look. He had been on a bit of a tear as of late, adding Toga to his harem, shabowinking with three new women, and swaggering about in front of his male classmates without any shame. It made him feel free and liberated at the time, but now that he had a moment to reflect and think about his behavior clearly, Izuku couldn't help feeling he had been a bit of a prick. Fortunately for the pussycats, Izuku was a man of his word. Since he had already promised them children, he wasn't going to backpedal, especially after taking the virginity that Ryuko had safeguarded for 31 years. Doing so would make him go from a prick to a bastard. So Izuku accepted them as a unique extension of his harem and resolved to be more principled in the future. Bizizi feeling his intuition activate, Izuku was slower than usual to pick up his cell phone and see who had messaged him. Fortunately, it was just Rumi asking when he and the girls were planning to arrive. He didn't know why it had triggered his intuition, but as there was only a 50% chance of the perk triggering meaningfully, Izuku assumed it was just a false positive. Reading Izuku's response, Rumi said aloud, he says they'll be arriving around 9 a.m., noon at the latest. Hearing Rumi's words, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman across from her licked her lips and mused, that gives me plenty of time to prepare a surprise. Narrowing her eyes at the cat-like woman, Rumi reminded, just try not to damage the island too much. Raising her brows, the blonde-haired woman, Ryuko, remarked, I never expected to hear that from someone like you. Does this island have a lot of sentimental value to you? Not really, said Rumi. But that doesn't mean I want it looking like a landslide passed through the area. Exhaling her characteristic meow, meow, meow type laugh, Ryuko replied, I'll keep that in mind. And thanks again for inviting me over. I was really surprised when I got your message. Rolling her eyes, Rumi flatly asserted, You can thank me by getting those brats into experience sharing range of my level. Nodding her head, Ryuko looked like she was about to respond in the affirmative, so she caught Rumi off guard by leaning forward, smiling mischievously as she asked, Did you know Izuku is in love with you? Looking offended, Rumi stared at Ryuko like she was looking at a crazy person, asking, What the hell are you talking about? Before furrowing her brows deeply and asserting, Things aren't like that between us. In a much fainter tone, smiling even wider, 
Ryuko had the glistening eyes of someone addicted to gossip as she playfully retorted. You're so full of it, yusajiyama san Even a blind person could see the two of you have more than superficial lust for one another. I mean, you came running over to our forest when he asked you to. And if you did the same, I can guarantee that little stud would run over here as fast as his feet or the prefectural line can carry him. Though she wanted to refute Ryuko's claims, Rumi could actually picture Izuku running over if she asked, causing her gaze to gradually meander to her phone. When she did, Ryuko's eyes narrowed further as she said, Do it! In a prompting tone. And if you really want to get him in a high gear, try telling him that you miss him. Furrowing her brows, Rumi asked, And then what? The three of us have a threesome? Stop trying to spur me on just because you're aroused. Spreading her hands and shrugging her shoulders, Ryuko responded. It would take him at least 20 to 30 minutes to get here. That's plenty of time for me to head back to the mainland and get checked into a hotel. Then the two of you can have the entire island to yourselves. Before Rumi could ask why Ryuko was trying to help her, the latter beat her to the punch, saying, Don't give me that skeptical look. The three of us decided to postpone getting pregnant until you had a bun in the oven. In other words, the sooner Izuka knocks you up, the sooner I can have kittens of my own. Rising to her feet, Ryuko added. That being said, I'll get out of your hair and return tomorrow morning. Have fun, yusajiyama san Without waiting for Rumi to respond, Ryuko promptly excused herself. In truth, she was hoping for a threesome, but since Rumi seemed opposed to the idea, she played it off smoothly. Fortunately, as Rumi planned to go on patrols even while Izuku and the girls were dwelling on the island, she should have plenty of opportunities to scratch her itch. Seeing Ryuko go, Rumi stared in the direction of her departure for several seconds before inevitably returning her gaze to her phone. She remained this way for several minutes, feeling equal parts stupid yet curious to see how Izuku would reply. Thus, even though she didn't truly miss him, she eventually typed, If you're not busy, I want to see you, with ellipses for emphasis. Though his response wasn't nearly as instantaneous as she would have liked, Rumi's coochie clenched involuntarily when Izuku responded with a curt, I'm on my way. Then, using the proximity function, she was able to see him rushing toward her at nearly 200 meters per second. As it was nearly 37 degrees and incredibly humid, Izuku was exhausted and caked in sweat by the time he reached Okinoshima. Fortunately, he had been able to cool himself a bit by running across the surface of the surrounding sea, which even in the middle of summer, was fairly cold and refreshing. Interrupting Izuku's attempts to control and regulate his breathing, Rumi abruptly dropped from the sky, landing next to him with an annoyed look as she asked, You didn't change or bring your luggage with you. Are you an idiot? Adopting a wry smile, Izuku replied, I'll have Momo create some clothes for me when she arrives tomorrow. Snorting through her nose, Rumi muttered, Whatever, before turning around, providing Izuku a view of her irresistible brown rear in her hero costume as she added, Don't forget that you're supposed to be studying for your CBEs. If you fail, that's on you. Without speaking further, Rumi abruptly flexed her legs leaping hundreds of meters in the direction of her residence. Izuku's smile became wryer as she did so, but even though he was completely exhausted, he channeled one for all through his body and chased after her. She didn't seem to be missing him as much as her message suggested, but as he was already there, he wasn't going to leave her unattended. Emerging from Rumi's room around 8 a.m., Izuku was looking forward to taking a warm bath and filling his belly when a familiar voice caused him to startle slightly, asking, Oh, have the two of you finally come to your senses? I was starting to think you wouldn't ever stop. Though he initially covered his junk, as he and Rumi were walking around her house completely undressed, Izuku uncensored himself as he asked, So, you were the cat Rumi was referring to a few hours ago? Good to see you, Ryuko. Instead of responding to Izuku's words directly, Ryuko stared down at his crotch, licking her lips and asking, Got another one in you? Answering in Izuku's stead, Rumi crossed her arms and ordered, 
we're about to take a bath. If you make yourself useful and cook something up for us, you can fool around a bit before the others arrive. Making a peace sign with her right hand, snipping it like scissors, Ryuko replied, I'll make something that'll knock your non-existent socks off before scampering off to the kitchen. She wasn't fond of being told what to do by a girl more than five years her junior. But as they were currently in Rumi's home, she decided to go along with the latter's power play. Preventing Izuku from following Ryuko's departure with his eyes, Rumi abruptly grabbed his meat grinder, saying, Let's go, before releasing him to lead the way. As a result, his eyes were firmly fixed on her remarkably toned, breathtakingly beautiful rear as he followed her to the bath. There, Rumi had him sit down before lathering up her body, using herself as a sponge to give him a very sensual wash. Doing so made him harder than a rock. So once they had rinsed off and moved to the bath, Rumi unhesitantly sat atop his lap, devouring his dong with her piping hot coochie before linking her arms around his shoulders and kissing him as if they had never taken a respite from ensuring she was pregnant. With Rumi apparently having stolen some of his clothes during her home visit, Izuka donned a black tank top and a pair of gym shorts while she changed into her hero costume, preparing to meet the girls at the shore of the island. Then, while she headed out, he made his way to the dining room, discovering Ryuko waiting patiently at the table in a short-sleeved pink blouse, a long skirt, and an apron. They were the same clothes she had been wearing earlier, but Izuku had been unable to get a good look at them since Rumi was being possessive. Adopting a smile the moment Izuku entered the room, Ryuko mused, You're really something. You and Mirko must have been going at it for hours, yet you still managed to last another half hour in the bath? Let's hope you show a similar vigor when it comes time to impregnate me. Returning a smile of his own, Izuka made his way over to the table, taking a seat as he flatly asserted, Rumi is an exception. If I were to do you the same way I do her, you'd break. Licking her lips, Ryuko narrowed her eyes and retorted, That could be an interesting experience. Then we'll cross that bridge when it comes, replied Izuku picking up his chopsticks and digging into Ryuko's restaurant-quality food. She had gone to college for three years, studying culinary arts and marketing, so even the rice she made was delicious. Seeing Izuku stuff his face with her food, Ryuko's expression softened into a more natural smile as she leaned forward with her elbows on the table and simply watched him eat. It was only after he had eaten enough food to feed five ordinary people that she plainly remarked, I'm going to be really disappointed if we don't do it at least once before the girls from your class arrive. Though he nearly did a spit take, Izuka managed to chew and swallow the food that was in his mouth before adopting a wry smile and replying, Then we should probably hurry. Rising to her feet, Ryuko lifted the hem of her skirt, revealing that she wasn't wearing anything as she playfully mused. I'm ready when you are, big boy, before lowering her skirt and adding, Let's take this party to my room since I'll need to put on my hero costume once we're done. Nodding in affirmation, Izuku quickly finished off the bowl of rice he was working on before chasing after Ryuko as she left the dining room. He felt like he had been shabboinking for days, but that wasn't going to stop him from giving the blonde-haired cat fanatic a proper shabboinking before Rumi returned with the girls, and he took a very long nap. With everyone choosing to travel as a group, Mina, Siu, Achiko, Kyoka, Toru, and Momo all arrived at Okinoshima aboard the same ferry. There, they met Rumi, following her to her home to find Izuku and Ryuko waiting for them outside. Contrasting Izuku's visible fatigue, Ryuko was more hyper than usual as she did a solo introduction pose and welcomed the girls to Okinoshima. Instead of returning her greeting, however, the girls focused their gazes on Izuku, to being the one to ask, Are you okay, Izuku-chan? You look exhausted, Ribbit. Sparing Izuku the need to respond, Rumi asserted, You're all going to be exhausted after seeing the training schedule I have lined up for you. This isn't some pleasure island where you can cut loose and have fun without a care. My current motto is work hard, play hard. So if you want to shaboink or fool around, I expect you to bust your butts. Shifting her gaze to Ryuko, Rumi narrowed her carmine eyes and adopted a teasing smile as she added, Dear thing, crazy cat lady, 
Though her left eye twitched, Ryuko struck a pose and responded with a vigorous right. As she did so, the soil in the surrounding area gathered rapidly, forming the shape of a 3M tall lizard man with remarkably realistic features. Returning her gaze to the girls, Rumi focused on Tsu, saying, You're the strongest girl in your class, at least physically. I want you to take this guy out while the rest of you observe your experience values. Okay, replied Tsu, releasing her suitcase and readily getting into a combat stance in her oversized vanilla t-shirt, short shorts, dark green camisole, and green tennis shoes. Then here goes, exclaimed Ryuko, controlling the lizard man to charge at Tsu with a rounded off earthen spear, leaping away from the lizard man much faster than it was able to close the distance. To bend her extremely flexible body like a bow, twisting Madeir before unleashing her exceptionally swift tongue like a whip. She wasn't too enthused about licking literal dirt, but she felt she needed to show off a bit since Mirko, one of her heroes, had called her the strongest in the group. Though it attempted to protect itself with its spear, the lizard man was bifurcated at the waist as Tsu's tongue lashed tore through its spear and body without difficulty. Tsuyu's strength and agility more than doubled when she actively utilized her quirk, albeit in small bursts, so the hastily made lizard man stood no chance against her godlike tongue. Nodding in approval, Rumi said, Not bad. You have powerful legs and fast reactions. Once you get a bit stronger, I'll teach you a few things that will allow you to make better use of them. Having to lick your opponent will put you at a disadvantage against those with amorphous bodies or toxic works. Before Tiyu could thank her for the praise, Rumi turned her attention to the rest of the group, asking, Did everyone gain experience? And, if so, how much? As she had been paying the closest attention to her experience, Momo was the first to answer, I gained 1056 experience, in a surprised tone, adding, a little more than 1% of the experience needed to advance to the next level. Following Momo, each of the girls confirmed they had received the same amount of experience. When Rumi turned to Ryuko, the blonde-haired cat girl revealed she had only acquired 138 experience while Izuku, similar to Rumi, had gained none. With Tsu being the highest among the girls at level 28, 19 levels lower than Ryuko's and Izuka's 47. It was fairly safe to assume the experience sharing range was between 10 to 15 levels. Crossing her arms and grinning like a demon, Rumi channeled her inner drill instructor, bellowing, All right, listen up, you whelps. From now until you leave, you'll wake up around 4.30 a.m. and train from 5 to noon. Your goal is to get within experience sharing range of this idiot and reach level 50 before the end of summer break. Any free attribute points you get will go straight into luck from now on. You hear me? Though Tsuyu and Kyoka stared blankly, Mina, Toru, Achiko, and Momo responded enthusiastically to Rumi's words. Level 50 was higher than the average level of a pro, so while it was a little ridiculous to consider they could reach it before the end of summer, they were thoroughly excited by the prospect. Fortunately, so long as they were within experience sharing range of each other, they would be able to grow at a similar rate. Waiting for everyone's excitement to simmer, Rumi added, Beyond your morning training, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want be it studying, visiting the city, or shabowinking around like idiots. The only caveat is that while I'm present, Izuku belongs to me. You should know by now that the two of us are trying for a baby, so when I'm not out on patrol, the two of us will be shabowinking like rabbits, undisturbed. Do I make myself clear? Though it was a little discomforting to hear, someone they respected speak in such an overbearing manner. Everyone responded in the affirmative to Rumi's stipulation. Fortunately, as they would soon learn, Rumi patrolled an average of 14 hours a day, generally only sleeping for 5 to 6, so they would have plenty of time to enjoy their summer break. While the girls were busy training with Ryuko, Izuka took a long bath before retiring to Rumi's bedroom, changing her bedding before lying face down in their love nest. He wasn't planning to fall asleep right then and there, but his body and mind seemed to have other ideas as, in the blink of an eye, for hours had passed. 
He knew this because Rumi poked her head into the bedroom, having just returned from her morning patrol, asking, Did you die on me? Turning his face to the side, Izuka stared at Rumi with sleepy eyes as he lazily asserted, Even if someone were to tear out my heart, I'd find a way to keep going as long as I knew you were waiting for me. Rolling her eyes, Rumi softly remarked, I see you still haven't outgrown using flattery and grandiloquent words. You do know that's not necessary anymore, right? Resisting the urge to point out that grandiloquent was a very big word, Izuku rolled onto his back, patting his chest as he replied, Then what are you waiting for? Bring me that Jiat. Though she made her way over to the bed, Rumi didn't stop to strip off her hero costume. Instead, she crawled into it, narrowing her eyes like a predator as she approached Izuku. However, rather than attacking him as she normally would, she curled up next to him, nestling her head against his shoulder and joining him for a three-hour nap. After all, he wasn't the only one exhausted from their 15 and a half hour shabo inking. After seeing Rumi off for her afternoon patrol, Izuku returned to the interior of her home, finding all the girls in the same room, studying for the second term or preparing for their CBEs. At this point, everyone was planning to test out of the general curriculum, not so they would have more time to fool around, but so they could focus on their training, work studies, and helping Melissa. Oh, Izuku, have you come to study with us? Asked Achiko, beaming the moment he entered the room. Sounds like fun, replied Izuku, taking a seat between Achiko and Tsuyu before asking, What's everyone studying? As she was leading the study group, Momo happily chimed, We're up to third year mathematics, specifically algebraic equations and factorizing. Here, we made a study packet for you as well. Accepting the preferred packet of papers, Izuka took a cursory glance at them, smiling wryly as he promptly redistributed his attributes. He could solve most of the problems if he took the time to think about them, but he preferred being able to know the answer at a glance. Before getting into the groove of studying, Izuku asked, How was it this morning? I already know it was productive, but I'm curious to hear your impressions of grinding experience. It's something we'll be doing a lot of in the future. It was super fun, replied Mina. I've always enjoyed combat training and moving my body, but seeing my stats increase is awesome. I went from level 23 to 25 and gained 4 strength, agility, vitality, and dexterity as well as 2 intelligence and luck. Piggybacking off of Mina's words, C stated, that seems to be a trend when we level up together. Our attributes increase by 10, with greater weight assigned to those that amplify our quirks. I also gained 2 levels and 20 bonus attributes but most of them went toward increasing my dexterity. I didn't gain even a single point in intelligence, Ribbit. Though she used to be one of the smartest girls in Class 1A, Tsuyu had placed among the lowest in the written exam since everyone but her and Kyoka had increased their intelligence to at least 100. Now, while she wasn't exactly struggling with the course material, she was becoming increasingly aware of the difference in intelligence the longer everyone studied together. 85 intelligence is still a lot, asserted Izuku. It's higher than most of our teachers and surpasses many of the PhD holders I've encountered. A lot of that can be attributed to their relatively low level, but still, even if your intelligence doesn't increase every single time you level, 85 is nothing to scoff at. Feeling that she had made Izuku worry over nothing, so you offered a faint caro as she hung her head and feigned focusing on her study packet. In response, Izuku caressed her smooth and noticeably cool hair, the result of her thermoregulation perk, keeping her body cool despite it being more than 29 degrees inside Rumi's distinctly traditional A-class house. Blinking in surprise, Izuku casually remarked, You're really cool to the touch, Tsuyu. I was wondering why you were the only one not sweating. Prompted by Izuku's words, Achiko reached over to touch Hiyu's leg, remarking, Oh wow, he's right, with a look of surprise on her face. She was fairly used to the summer heat since she usually turned her AC off to save money when it got especially hot out, but she was sweating buckets alongside everyone but Tsuyu and Toru. Momo had produced several fans for them, 
but they only helped a little since they were circulating hot and incredibly humid air. Fearing she might become everyone's hug pillow, Siu promptly pointed out, my thermoregulation perk isn't perfect. If everyone suddenly starts hugging me, I'll quickly overheat, rib it. I bet you wouldn't mind if it were Izuku amused Mina, narrowing her peculiar gold and black scara eyes in amusement. Fortunately, before things could get out of hand, Izuku quickly changed topics, asking, Any word on when Melissa and Toga will be joining us? As she was typically the one to keep track of such things, it was Momo who answered, Toga's parents are taking her to visit family in Okinawa, so the earliest she can join us is the final week of summer break. As for Melissa, she should be coming by later this afternoon, but will only stay for three to four days before returning to the campus. She has a lot of work to do back at UA. Yeah, I figured as much, replied Izuku. Nizu was determined to turn UA into even more of a fortress than it already was. So Melissa was nearly as busy as Cementos and the other teachers in charge of construction. She had more leeway than the average teacher. But with news of the MWT phenomenon gradually spreading due to escalating crises in countries that lacked the means to defend themselves, they only had so much time to prepare. Pulling out his cell phone, Izuku opened up the group chat as he added, Still, we should ask her to bring over a space cooler or something similar. Studying like this without an AC is just torture. Though she agreed wholeheartedly with Izuku's statement, Mina mused, Look on the bright side. With it being this hot outside, we have plenty of excuses to wear our swimsuits and take a dip in the ocean. We were going after our morning training, but you were asleep and we didn't want to wake you. Inserting herself into the conversation, Kyoka flatly appended, We were planning to do a barbecue as well, but Pixie Bob Sensei said Yusujiyami doesn't allow meat eating on the island. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, replied Izuku, smiling wryly as he added, Rumi gets nauseous if she eats or smells cooked meat, so most of the food we eat here is vegan. Is it because she's a rabbit? Asked Siu, understanding Rumi's plight, as she was classified as she, much like Ryuko, was classified as a lesser heteromorph. Both of her parents possessed heteromorphic qualities, but her father was a full-blown heteromorph, his quirk, toad, giving him the face and physiology of a toad. As a result, Siu had gone through a very long period where she couldn't process ordinary human food. Nodding his head, Izuku revealed, Rumi's mom is a rabbit heteromorph, and her father possessed an enhancement type quirk that allowed him to strengthen his legs. Rumi inherited a combination of their powers, making her a lesser heteromorph capable of reinforcing her body, specifically her legs. Just how strong is she capable of becoming? Asked Mina, genuinely curious as Mirko was also one of her heroes growing up. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku replied, I'm not entirely sure, but based on what I've observed, the only restriction on enhancement type quirks is their fuel source and vitality. Sato-san is a good example of this, as his quirk is only supposed to boost his physical attributes fivefold for three minutes, but he has feats that are far beyond that. As for Rumi, I've seen her strength and agility increase to more than 5,000, albeit only for a few seconds. If she wanted to maintain that state permanently, she'd need at least 10 times the amount in vitality. So that's why your stats are so weird, remarked Mina. I was wondering why your base strength and agility hover between 10 and 20. It's so that when you power yourself up, you don't place as much of a strain on your body. That's right, replied Izuku. However, even with 10 to 20 times the vitality, there is a limit to how much I can reinforce my attributes without a strong base. I can't just set my strength, agility, and dexterity to one and strengthen myself infinitely by putting everything into vitality. There is a disparity between the density and tensile strength of my bones, muscles, and tendons, so I generally keep my strength and agility at a tenth of my vitality allowing me to maintain a permanent 10x boost. Well, so long as I don't overexert myself. That's still pretty broken, said Mina. Especially with your quirk allowing you to redistribute your attributes. Since we gain at least 15 attribute points per level, 
That means your power and speed increase by 100% of their base every 8 levels. Blinking in surprise, as he wasn't yet accustomed to Mina being smart, Izuka paused for a moment before responding. You're not wrong. But, even if I one day surpass All Might, that doesn't mean I'll be invincible. Certain quirks have the potential to ignore the difference in level and stats outright. Space Hero 13's Black Hole is a good example, as even if I had a million vitality, I'd still be atomized if I came into contact with her power directly. There is also a member of the police force with a quirk called Scissors that allows her to cut through anything by making a cutting gesture with her fingers or legs. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, levels and attributes aren't absolute. Aizawa Sensei can take out people with mutant and enhancement type quirks despite having a smaller stature and a much weaker physique. His dexterity is one reason, but that came about as a result of his techniques and his experience cultivated fighting foes more powerful than himself. If he had access to powerful support items, he'd be an absolute beast with his ability to negate other people's quirks. In other words, we shouldn't underestimate people just because our level is higher. Is that what you're trying to say? Asked Suyu. Nodding in affirmation, Izuku replied, That's exactly right. I mean, just look at our principal. He's basically stuck at level 8, but he's one of the most influential people in the entire world. If you gave him time to plan and prepare, he could probably take on all of us without raising a finger against us directly. Shaking his head a second time, Izuku added, Anyways, we're getting off track. I'm down if everyone wants to take a break and hit the beach, but since we've already gathered like this, we might as well get in a few hours of studying. The CBEs are only 20 days from now, and the provisional licensing exam is two days later. We have an advantage over most other students participating in the exam, but it's better to be overprepared than under. Eh, so long as we get to go to the beach at least once during summer break, I'm fine, said Mina. Just don't forget that you owe me since my birthday took place over the summer training camp. We should hit up the city at least once before we return to Shizuoka. Adopting a wry smile, Izuka teased, and here I was hoping you had forgotten about it. Now my surprise isn't going to be nearly as effective. Covering her mouth to stifle a mischievous snicker, Mina narrowed her eyes and playfully retorted. Then I suppose you will just have to make it extra special or surprising to compensate. I'll keep that in mind, replied Izuku. He had already made plans for him and Mina to go skydiving, but since she wanted something extra special, he figured they could go paragliding or cliff diving afterward. Then, once things started to cool down, they could retire to a hotel where he would present her with the acid-proof outfit he had custom-made for her when she accepted his suggestion of Pink Majin as a hero name. After a few hours of studying, Izuku and the others went outside to meet Melissa. Instead of meeting her at the shoreline, however, they waited for her outside as Melissa had told them she'd be landing nearby. Is that a floating cube? Asked Mina, reacting to the 3x3m yellow-orange cube hovering in the air a few tens of meters above them. It looks like the mobile factory that May was working on, replied Izuku. Melissa must have helped her finish and upgrade it. It wasn't able to fly the last time I saw it. With the cube's thrusters kicking up a fair amount of dust, Izuku created a wall from Black Whip, shielding everyone as four mechanical legs unfurled from the cube's base, allowing it to land stably. Then, from a hatch at the top, Melissa poked out her head and upper body, waving excitedly as she shouted, Hey, everyone! Sorry for arriving so late! Climbing out of the cuboid vehicle, Melissa jumped from its roof, her saws producing a faint hissing sound and pushing away a small amount of dust as she landed. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, Did you install the ETS air compression system into your shoes? Good eye, replied Melissa, turning around to display her voluminous rear and the soles of her shoes. The latter had what looked like a series of red ball bearings briefly reminding Izuku of a certain time-controlling homo with an obsession for flames. I've been experimenting with alternatives to the two-wheeled model, said Melissa. These aren't really suited to rural areas, but they allow me to jump from up to 20 meters without straining my legs or sustaining injuries. 
Raising his brows, Izuku asked, Are the bearings made from the same material as the mid and full gauntlets? Though she nodded her head, Melissa clarified, It's similar, but not the same. The energy transfer properties of vermilion are great for absorbing shocks and redirecting kinetic energy, but it isn't suitable for standard at wheels and compression systems. Since that's rely on the user's weight and kicking power to accelerate. Negating that power and redirecting it into the ground would just cause you to produce craters and potholes without going anywhere. Makes sense, replied Izuku. Then, before he could say anything more, Mina chimed in to ask, If you're already testing alternative models, does that mean you've already completed the standard at design? Thumbing toward her cube-shaped mech, Melissa replied, The standard use models have been completed for a while. I can make a pair for you if Momo can provide the materials. That's one of the reasons I brought over baby number 414, friend Cube. I'd be happy to be of assistance, replied Momo, leading to a situation where Melissa mass-produced generic at for everyone to try out. She had already developed an all-terrain wool type that could be used on dirt, so everyone was able to skate around at decently high speeds, so long as they avoided dense, grassy areas. As expected, Mina had the easiest time trying out the ATS, even though Tsuyu had the highest dexterity in the group. She had actual experience with skating and performing tricks, while Tsuyu was more accustomed to jumping around and pouncing on all fours. With Mina's help, however, all the girls were able to get a basic grasp of accelerating, decelerating, and performing simple tricks in a very short period. While everyone else familiarized themselves with ATS, Izuka sat off to the side with Melissa, smiling relaxedly as she prattled on about all the things she had been working on in the week, or so they had been apart. He was a little surprised to learn the school had a shielding and propulsion system that allowed it to rise out of the ground like a literal floating fortress out of a fantasy novel, but in hindsight, he should have expected as much from Nizu. It sounds like you've been having fun, remarked Izuku, waiting for a lull in the conversation. Adopting a smile that brightened her surroundings noticeably, Melissa replied, I would be lying if I said I didn't miss my father, but your mom and everyone at UA treat me well. Seemingly recalling something, Melissa covered her mouth and exclaimed a faint O oh, before staring directly at Izuku, adopting a wry smile as she said, That reminds me. Your mother asked me to tell you not to run out of the house and vanish without telling her where you're going. She seemed worried and a little... Angry, nodding his head, Izuka said, I'll be sure to give her a call tonight. For now, wanted to show you around? We can also install the AC unit you brought over. Sounds good, replied Melissa, promptly rising to her feet and extending her hand to help Izuka stand. He didn't need it, but he accepted it with a smile, allowing the buxom blonde to pull into his feet before giving her a brief tour of Rumi's residence introducing her to the sunbathing Ryuko in the process. The latter wasn't nearly as fond of napping as Shino, but after exhausting more than half her vitality to help the girls train, taking a cat nap and sunbathing in the courtyard was an excellent way to recoup. Giving voice to Izuku's thoughts, Ryuko mused, You're one lucky little fella, you know that? As Ryuko was washing him, Willfully squishing her melons against his back as she reached around to caress the front of his body, Izuka calmly replied, I'm well aware, while lathering and massaging the red-faced Melissa's melons from behind. I'd say Melissa's the lucky one in this instance, remarked Mina, staring at the trio from the corner of her eyes as she washed Toru. Everyone had decided to take a bath before dinner so they were presently taking turns washing and rinsing each other off before getting in the onsen-style bath. Reacting to Mina's remark, Toru puffed out her cheeks and poutily replied, I know, right? I want Izuka to wash me as well. Then feel free to come over here once I'm finished with Melissa, said Izuku, his expression and voice calm despite his massive erection. I'll wash every single one of you if you want me to, interjecting before Toru could respond. Ryuko remarked, that's a bit much. I'm all for keeping things fair, but it isn't practical to try and please everyone all at once. If you say things like that, you'll have everyone here forming a cue to receive your affection. Myself included. Punctuating her words by licking Izuka's ear, 
Ryuko made it clear she was holding herself back to set a good example for the rest of the girls. She was nearly twice as old as everyone present, so she had a duty to prevent things from getting too out of hand. Undermining Ryuko's efforts to moderate the situation, Izuku casually asserted, It's something I want to do, so if they want me to wash their bodies and are willing to wait, I see no reason not to. That being said, leaning closer to Melissa, Izuku kissed her shoulder before saying, I think I've played with your melons long enough. You should rinse off and head to the bath. All right, replied Melissa, blushing up to her ears as she rose to her feet and made her way over to one of the detachable shower heads lining the wall. She was feeling a little dizzy since this was the first time Izuku had touched her melons directly and the first time they were bathing together. The most they had done previously was hold hands, kiss, and cuddle. So she suddenly felt like she was on the fast track towards something more. Though he initially followed Melissa's departure with his eyes, Izuku's attention was diverted when Toru promptly plopped down in front of him. Mina had already lathered her up, but that didn't stop Izuku from giving her a very thorough rubdown, wrapping things up with Achiko, as most of the other girls had enough sense to join Melissa in the bath. I'm home, home shouted Rumi, announcing her arrival to the entire house. She usually just came inside directly, but since there were people other than Izuka present, she figured she would give him at least a brief heads up. Emerging from her room in a pair of cat-themed lingerie, Ryuko replied, No need to be so loud. Izuka's waiting in your bedroom, and we saved food for you under a cloche. If you're serious about having a baby, you'll need to mind your health and nutrient intake. Crossing her arms, Rumi pointedly replied, I don't need to hear that from you, before pausing for a moment and asking, What's with your getup? Striking a pose that showed off her curves and the artificial cat tail she was wearing, Ryuko mused, I'm planning to seduce Izuka once you go on your evening patrol. Don't worry, I brought plenty of birth control and protection with me. Furrowing her brows slightly, Rumi briefly considered telling Ryuko to piss off. Instead, she muttered, Whatever, before making her way past the salacious cat girl, skipping her meal to seek out Izuka directly. Upon entering her room, Rumi's eyes widened, her right brow rising quite a bit as she softly exclaimed, What the hell? Though the layout of her room hadn't changed, Rumi noticed her bed was larger and that there were pylon-like space coolers one at each corner of the room. More noticeably, thick, porous black panels covered the walls and ceiling, while ornate, canopy-style curtains hung from the roof around her bed. Lying atop Rumi's bed with his feet crossed, a relaxed smile, and hands behind his bed, Izuku replied, You can get pretty loud once we get going. So I installed some sound-absorbing panels and thick curtains to prevent your screams from keeping everyone awake. We also swapped out your bed and outfitted it with a powerful suspension system so we can go all out without worrying about breaking the bed or floor. Narrowing her eyes, Rumi reiterated, You're really treating this place like your own. You're right, replied Izuku, patting his thigh as he added, Just as you treat me like your own. Exhaling a soft chuckle, Rumi began to strip out of her hero costume as she replied, Well, you're not wrong. Then, for the better part of three hours, she gave Izuku's soundproofing and Melissa's suspension system a thorough test. After seeing Rumi off one final time, kissing her before she departed, Izuka made his way inside, initially intending to get some rest before encountering Ryuko standing against the threshold of her bedroom door, arms crossed as she stared at him and licked her lips in her cat-themed lingerie. Adopting a wry smile, Izuka mused, well, you have worked hard today, before making his way and allowing Ryuko to yank him by the collar into her room. Without her Earth Beasts, they would struggle to surpass level 40 in their entire career as pro heroes. Thus, Ryuko believed she deserved at least some special treatment, preferably a lot. Though Melissa originally planned to sit out on the early morning training, this changed when they realized she was within experience sharing range of everyone but see you in Momo. Is it really okay for me to just sit here like this? Asked Melissa, relaxing on the Engua, the veranda encircling Japanese-style houses with Izuku. It's fine, 
reply to Zuku, his eyes absent-mindedly scanning his chemistry textbook as he added, Your luck and prodigy perk make everyone level faster just by being around. You're welcome to join them and train directly, but you're already invaluable with the support you provide. Adopting a faint smile, Melissa muttered, I just wish I could do more. In a sincere tone, turning his attention away from his textbook, Izuka smiled at Melissa and affirmed, You can do anything you like, Melissa. Even if you chose to stay here the rest of the break, I doubt the principal would complain. After all, the stronger and smarter we become, the easier it will be to overcome the challenges awaiting us in the future. With Izuku extending his left hand toward her, palm up, the corners of Melissa's smile curled upward as she linked the fingers of her right hand through his. Doing so caused her heart to beat madly within her chest, but she managed to appear relatively calm as she suggested studying or working on his sky regalia together. Her intelligence had increased by 30 in less than 3 hours, so her mind was filled with ways they could use their time better. Name, Melissa Shield. Title, Pleasantly Plump Pioneer. Vitality, Intelligence, Dexterity, Luck plus 20. Quirk, Not Applicable, Bond Level, 97. Current Level, 14 to 20. Effective Level, 69 to 78. Attributes, Strength, 20. Agility, 20. Vitality, 100 to 112. Intelligence, 263 to 293. Dexterity, 70 to 88. Luck, 226 to 256. Free attributes, zero. Perks, healthy body, breakthrough, prodigy. Reading between the lines of Melissa's proposal, Izuku raised his brows and asked, are you sure? In a faint tone. Melissa wasn't a prude, but she had fairly conservative values. She had to push herself to take a bath with him. So he thought it would be at least a few weeks, potentially even months, before she was open to the idea of taking their relationship to the next level. Adopting a marginally wryer smile, Melissa replied, I've had a lot of time to think about it. I originally planned to wait until I was married before entrusting my first time to my husband, but with you engaged to Momo and the potential end of the world on the horizon, waiting doesn't seem the wisest course of action. Now, I just want to be on the same page as everyone else. Though he didn't outright agree with Melissa's reasoning, Izuku wasn't going to try and talk her out of her decision. Rather, ever since they had officially become a couple, he had been looking forward to the moment he and Melissa got down and dirty. Thus, without further discussion, he led the beautiful blonde into Rumi's home to help her get caught up with everyone else. Contrasting the two to three weeks that Rumi thought it would take, Tsuyu and Momo managed to get within experience, sharing range of Ryuko and Izuku after only nine days of training. This confirmed, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the experience sharing range was 15 levels as both girls were level 32, while the latter duo was 47. Fortunately, due to each level beyond 30 requiring the same amount of experience as 1 to 30, the rest of the girls, even Melissa, weren't far behind. Each was at least level 30, so Rumi gave everyone a three-day break to have fun and enjoy themselves at the beach. Though he wasn't particularly fond of swimming after nearly drowning during his army combat water survival test in his previous life, Izuku was enjoying his time at the beach. Even Rumi had taken the day off, donning a purple and gold-trimmed bikini and a purple sarong as she sunbathed on a towel next. She hated swimming, as she was prone to ear infections, so she had him apply a healthy dose of tanning lotion before dozing off at his side. Tearing his eyes from the heavenly sight of the girls playing volleyball, four against four, Izuku stared silently at Rumi's peacefully sleeping face. Her cervix had lowered and closed up a few days prior, so even though she had yet to take a pregnancy test, there was a very good chance she was already expected. The surest sign of this was a noticeable decrease in her libido, but to make sure, they went at it for at least two to three hours a day, albeit with less intensity than usual. Demonstrating that she wasn't actually asleep, Rumi asked, What is it? Before opening her eyes, just enough to reveal her distinct yet remarkably common carmine irises. 
Her inordinately long eyelashes also fluttered in an innately seductive manner, causing the corners of Izuku's smile to curl up as he softly mused, just admiring the mother of my unborn children. Rolling her eyes, Rumi raised her upper body onto her elbows, allowing her voluminous, uncovered melons to dangle tantalizing as she narrowed her eyes and asked, Is that all? Sure, you don't want something else? Raising his eyes and caressing his chin, Izuka jokingly replied, Maybe a BJ? You wish, retorted Rumi, rising to a seated position and slouching forward with her legs crossed as she appended. Even if I have your kids, that isn't going to make me enjoy the taste of juice or having a veritable pole shoved up my rear. If you want to do stuff like that, drag one of those brats into the bushes or something. Though she relished shabboinking, Rumi abhorred non-coochie plays. Her singular preference was cream pies, so even hand jobs were off the table unless she was washing or wanted to tease him. Maintaining a relaxed smile, Izuku casually replied, Maybe later. I've got a pretty good vibe going right now. Snorting through her nose, Rumi remarked, You sound like an old man before abruptly pulling her ass-length white hair up in a ponytail, asking, Do you have a scrunchie or something? Resisting the urge to ask why he'd have something like that, Izuku replied, No, but Momo could probably make you one. Why? Giving my proposal a second thought? Narrowing her eyes, Rumi sent Izuku a sidelong stare, silently warning him not to push his luck before shifting her gaze to the girls, and saying, Pick the girl you want me to swap with. I'm going to kick the rest of their butts in volleyball. Though he was tempted to say he wouldn't trade her for anyone, Izuku had come to accept that Rumi wasn't fond of overly flirtatious or cheesy remarks. Instead, he responded with a curt kyoka, understanding that she was only participating to ensure the teams had an even number of participants. The droopy-eared one, right? Asked Rumi, pretending she had yet to memorize the names of everyone present. Seeing Izuku nod his head, Rumi fixed her bikini top before rising to her feet and making her way over to the larger group of girls. Her presence brought a momentary end to the fairly intense game of volleyball, calling for a rearrangement of teams while Kyoka, blushing up to her ears, made her way over to Izuku. Before Izuku could ask why her face was red, Kyoka averted her eyes and revealed, Mirko said you wanted to take me into the bushes. Exhaling a light chuckle, Izuku adopted a teasing smile as he replied, Well, she isn't wrong. But let's do that some other time. For now, how about we chill or have a chat? I've been meaning to ask you about your parents and a few other things, but we haven't had many chances to be alone this summer. Managing to sound both disappointed and relieved, Kyoka responded with a faint O oh, before taking a seat on Rumi's towel, drawing up her legs to hug her knees as she admitted, I've been thinking the same thing. Ever since the incident at Eye Island and this meta-world transversal crap, it feels like you've been doing your own thing. I'm not complaining, but it would be nice to hang out like we used to. Nodding his head, Izuku replied, Look on the bright side. Since we'll be living in the same dorms from now on, we'll be able to hang out as much as we want. The entire fifth floor is soundproofed, so I'm looking forward to learning bass or guitar from you. Perking up at the mention of Izuku learning an instrument, Kyoko offered a curt sounds rockin', before combing back the bangs framing the left side of her face, adding, I could ask Momo to make us a pair of basses if you want to start practicing now. You know, I'm not really good at making idle chatter. At least not with the boy I like, thought Kyoko. She had no trouble speaking with Momo and had recently started getting along with Achiko and Tsuyu. However, Whenever she was alone with Izuku, the knowledge that they could be doing more prevented her from speaking freely. Sounds good, replied Izuku, seizing the initiative to rise to his feet, sparing Kyoka the effort of getting up. Fortunately, the volleyball game had yet to kick off, so he was able to acquire a pair of bass guitars that nearly caused Kyoka to faint since they were modeled after a brand worth around $370,000 in the current market. Before hopping into her friend cube and returning to UA, Melissa hugged everyone but the absent Rumi. When she finally got to Izuku, he gave her a lengthy kiss, holding her voluptuous body for the better part of a minute before releasing her lips, adopting a teasing smile. 
and whispering. Enjoy making babies with May. Swallowing the remnant saliva in her mouth and throat, it was Melissa's turn to surprise Izuku, whispering, Let's make babies together when you get back. Before Izuku could respond, Melissa abruptly escaped from his embrace, taking advantage of her boosted stats to leap onto the roof of her friend Cube, retreating to its interior before subsequently taking off. She wasn't very good at flirting, especially with onlookers present. So she even used her cube's emergency thrusters to escape the island faster. There she goes, muttered Izuku, a relaxed smile adorning his face, until Toru abruptly leaped on him from behind, dangling from his neck as she playfully exclaimed, Kiss me next, before planting a sloppy one on his cheek. Instead of chastising Toru for her behavior, Izuku pulled her around to his front, silencing her with a kiss and a cheeky squeeze of her bottom. Since she was undressed, even while appearing to be fully clothed, he could feel the warmth of her body against his fingers and palm, prompting him to give her a firm squeeze before retracting his hand and separating from her lips to say, Now behave! In a faint yet authoritative tone, licking her lips, Toru responded with a mischievous, For now! Before giving Izuka's semi a playful squeeze with her right hand. Afterward, she separated from him of her own accord, making her way over to the other girls with a cheerful smile. Izuku briefly followed her with his gaze, before noticing that everyone but Momo was staring at him with at least a hint of expectation in their eyes. Achiko, in particular, looked like she wanted to tackle him. So Izuku adopted a wry smile, spreading his arms as he joked. First come, first served. The Rumi gave them three days to rest and relax. The girls convinced Ryuko to let them train. They wanted to be as strong as possible before the provisional licensing exam, so they continued pushing themselves in the morning and studying in the afternoon. This continued throughout the second week and into the third, allowing each girl to reach level 40 while Ryuko and Izuka both attained level 48. It appears that Togasan will be unable to attend the camp, said Momo, waiting until everyone had gathered for their lingerie-clad afternoon study session before updating Izuku on the situation. Before Izuku could ask for clarification, Momo added, Her parents don't want her moving into the dorm before there are teachers there to oversee her safety. Her father is said to be very overprotective. Adopting a mischievous grin, Mina narrowed her eyes in Izuka's direction as she teased. Looks like you have an uphill battle. Rolling his eyes, Izuka casually retorted. An uphill battle? I have a harem comprising every girl in my class. I may as well be climbing a vertical wall with my teeth. I could see you pulling it off, said Siu, catching Izuku a little off guard as she revealed. I already explained the situation to my parents. My Tucson wasn't particularly enthused, but he said it's fine so long as I'm happy and you're able to protect me, Ribbit. Wow, how bold, said Mina. I told my parents I was seeing someone, but that's it. My mom can be pretty understanding, but my dad would flip if he found out I was involved with a guy dating multiple girls. Following the conversation's trend, Achiko pressed the tips of her fingers together as she meekly supplied, I've also been reluctant to explain the situation to my parents. They know that I'm dating Izuku, but that's about it. It's better just to come forward and be honest, asserted Siyu. They might be against our situation initially, but Izuka-chan should be able to earn their trust, Ribbit. He isn't without his faults, but he has the strength of character, the conviction, and the assets to support all of us. Jeez, Tsuchan, you have such a pragmatic way of looking at things said Toru, prompting several girls to nod. Shrugging her shoulders, Tsuyu pointed out, Everyone promised to do their best to make things work. Trying to keep our relationship a secret from our parents isn't practical, Ribbit. It's like laying minds beneath our feet. Nodding her head, Momo adopted one of her characteristically bubbly smiles as she appended, I am in agreement with Tsuyu-san. We should arrange a social gathering which all of our parents can attend. It may be incredibly awkward for some, but formalizing our relationship will make it more palatable for those who might oppose us staying together. Though Tsuyu nodded in approval, everyone else had awkward smiles or outright conflicted looks. 
Izuku was among the latter. But he also knew it was pointless to try and keep things a secret when he was involved with more than a dozen women. Things would only become more complicated once the MWT phenomenon reached Japan. So he eventually nodded and said, If we're going that far, we might as well reveal everything. I'll talk to the principal and see if we can't turn the event into a briefing on the Meta World Transversal Phenomenon. Ugh, to shoot me now? Lamented Kyoka, sprawling backward with a protracted, exasperated groan. It hadn't been that long since she convinced her parents that she and Izuku were meant to be together. How was she supposed to explain that she was just one woman in his expansive harem? Understanding Kyoka's plight, Izuku adopted a wry smile and said, I'm prepared to eat a few punches. You'll be lucky if my dad doesn't take a guitar over your head, muttered Kyoka. Then, before Izuku could respond, she abruptly rose to a seated position, passing her gaze over Momo, Achiko, Tsumina, and Toru as she said, You all need to come over to my place. I need to introduce you to my parents before they learn the truth. With everyone nodding or verbally offering their assent, Kyoka shifted her gaze to Izuku, narrowing her eyes slightly as she said, As for you, try not to add any other women to your harem, at least for the time being. Though he empathized with what Kyoka was saying, Izuku couldn't help frowning. Fortunately, he didn't have to defend himself as Achiko came to his defense, stating, That isn't being fair to Izuku, Kyoka-chan. He has always come to us first before sleeping with other women. Nodding her head, Momo added, That is correct. Izuku has always been very forthcoming with us. I support limiting or specifying the number of women he's intimate with, but we should be wary of making it sound like he's philandering about or simply doing as he pleases. Furrowing her brows, Kyoko avoided eye contact with everyone as she muttered, That I wasn't trying to unable to find the words to express herself. Kyoka eventually fell silent. Before she could think to apologize, however, Izuka shook his head and said, No, Kyoka's right. At the very least, I let myself go a bit during the summer training camp. I keep telling myself I'm more than happy being with all of you. But being pursued by mature women and being allowed to reveal the specifics of my quirk gave me an inflated ego. Lowering his gaze slightly, Izuka stared at nothing in particular as he added, Now that it's virtually guaranteed that Rumi's pregnant, I should get my act together. Though Ryuko, Shino, and Tomoko seemed fairly content with him being an absent father, Izuka couldn't imagine leaving Rumi alone to take care of their child by herself. They were both reluctant to admit it, but he was fairly certain he and Rumi loved one another. Then why don't we use this opportunity to set a soft cap on the number of women you have in your harem? Proposed Momo. The six of us have already discussed the possibility of adding the girls from Class 1B. So if we include Namuri sensei Rumi-san, Mei-san, Melissa, and the members of the Wild, Wild Pussycats, that makes 21. Raising his face, Izuka's tone reflected the incredulity in his expression as he asserted, I have no intention of dating anyone from Class 1B. Also, I don't believe the pussycats regard themselves as members of my harem. I'm more of a proactive sperm donor to them. Though she nodded in affirmation, Momo argued, Be that as it may, it's better to consider them a part of our group rather than outsiders. As for the girls from Class 1B, do you truly have no intentions or desires toward any of them? I'm certain that Kinoko Komori girl has a crush on you. Hearing Momo mention Komori, a shudder ran through Toru's body. She was confident she could win in a fight, especially now, but ever since the incident that occurred during the final exam, she regarded Komori as her arch-nemesis. Shaking his head, Izuka calmly replied, It's not about having intentions or desires. I barely managed to work things out with the guys in our class. If I involved myself with the girls of another, I'd make a lot of enemies. Crossing her left arm under her melons and grasping her chin with her right index finger and thumb, Momo muttered, I see. If that's the case, we can disregard girls from our age group and concentrate more on older women and active heroines. Raising his right brow, Izuka's expression regained a hint of incredulity as he remarked, Or we could just keep things as they are. Contrasting what everyone seems to believe, 
I'm not that libidinous. Dealing critical damage to Izuka's psyche. Everyone, even Achiko, stared at him with varying degrees of disbelief. The former could take on all six of them without getting exhausted or being affected the ensuing day. So while they didn't regard him as an incorrigible pervert, they knew he was a beast with a near insatiable appetite for new and exotic things. Understanding that the girl's reactions were based on his past behavior, Izuku closed his eyes and took a deep, steadying breath. He had willfully taken advantage of their permission to sleep with other women, so there was no sense in convincing them he had no interest in other women. What he needed to do was restrain himself better. So after a lengthy moment of silence, he opened his eyes and stated, I don't want a large harem. What I want is for you girls to be happy. Though he had let things get out of hand, Izuku was sincere in his desire to make the six girls before him happy. He couldn't abandon Toga, give up on his relationship with Rumi, or back out of his arrangement with Ryuko, Shino, and Tomoko, but his top priority should be ensuring the happiness of the six girls in front of him. That's what he had pledged when they first became a couple. So even if the circumstances allowed him to expand his harem freely, he resolved to keep things as they were. What's got your panties in a bunch? Asked Rumi, undressing in front of Izuku, as the latter observed her with a listless look from their shared bed. Shaking his head, Izuku revealed, It's nothing serious. I just promised the girls I wouldn't be expanding my harem further. I've already pushed my luck, so I'd like to focus on developing my existing relationships rather than letting my meat grinder dictate my actions. Raising her brows, Rumi momentarily ceased undressing to stare at Izuku, asking, You serious? At this point, I could be convinced your balls would explode if you didn't shoot it out at least 20 times a day. Adopting a slight smile, Izuku playfully remarked, Even if that were the case, I wouldn't have anything to worry about with you around. If you let Toga transform into you, I may even be drained completely. Waving her hand, Rumi responded with a curt, not happening, before resuming undressing. She had briefly considered it when Izuka told her about Toga's fairly ridiculous title, but she couldn't stomach the thought of someone borrowing her appearance to shaboink her man. It would be one thing if they shaboinked normally, but if Toga did things for Izuku that she was unwilling to do. Feeling a little annoyed, Rumi surprised Izuku immensely by saying, Go and wash your dong. Just this once, I'll try sucking it. Though he was tempted to ask if she had lost her mind, Izuku's response to Rumi's words was to hop out of bed and race toward the bathroom. He had no idea what had spurred the buxom bunny to want to suck his dong, but he sure as hell wasn't going to pass on the opportunity. Seeing Izuku run like a fool, Rumi was reminded of when he came racing over to her two weeks prior. He had literally run across the surface of the sea to reach her faster a sentiment that in hindsight caused a faint smile to develop across her face. Having stripped down to nothing, Rumi made her way over to her wardrobe, retrieving her recently tailored high school uniform. At the same time, she also pulled out a small plastic device with a purple cap and a circular display showing two pink strips. She had secretly been taking pregnancy tests every morning since her cervix abruptly closed up and became firm like cartilage. Now, after 11 days of uncertainty, she knew, without a shadow of a doubt, she was pregnant. August 26, 2149. With her three-week training camp coming to an end the following day, Rumi gathered everyone for a small party, forcing Izuku to sit next to her as everyone sat around a circular table created by Momo. Listen up, rats, said Rumi, drawing everyone's attention to her before adding, I can't say I'm particularly proud of any of you, but you all made decent progress these past three weeks. But remember this, you're still green. Even that monster All Might isn't completely invincible, so don't let your newfound strength go to your heads. Understood? Though Rumi didn't actively participate in their training, each of the girls responded with a loud yes ma'am, nodding her head in approval. Rumi adopted a mischievous grin as she added, that being said, so long as you're willing to accept responsibility for your actions, you're free to act as overconfident as you like. Those who can keep smiling and never give up, even when defeated or humbled, 
are capable of just about anything. I may not have been impressed by your growth these past few weeks, but I have high expectations for your future, even if you'll never be as strong as me. Name, Rumi Yusujiyama. Title, Voracious Rabbit. Attributes randomly increase during shadowinking. Quirk Rabbit. Bond Level, 100. Current Level, 84. Effective Level, 267 to 301. Attributes. Strength, 395 to 418. Agility, 453 to 516. Vitality, 656 to 738. Intelligence, 55 to 71. Dexterity, 468 to 520. Luck, 643 to 748. Free attributes, 0. Perks, fleet-footed. Thunderous thighs, healthy body, second wind, keen senses, lucky rabbit's foot. Though they had slowed down quite a bit the past few weeks, Rumi and Izuku still shabbling for four to six hours a day. As a result, her effective level had increased by 34, surpassing the growth of everyone at the table without raising her base level even a single time. Shifting her gaze to Izuku, Rumi winked with her left eye, smiling as she said, I'm about done here. Make sure to clean up after yourselves before you leave tomorrow morning. Without waiting for Izuka's response, Rumi rose to her feet and promptly departed the dining room. In her wake, Ryuko abruptly shouted, Dibs, before pouncing on Izuku like a drunken cat. The plum wine everyone had been drinking was non-alcoholic, but that didn't prevent the feisty blonde from throwing what few inhibitions she had out the window. After parting ways with the girls at the dorms, Izuka made his way home, stopping before he entered since he could feel the telltale vibrations of machinery in motion. Opening the party menu and triggering the proximity function, Izuka's brows perked up. Not because Mei was in the workshop, but because she wasn't the only member of his party nearby. Adopting a wry smile, Izuka scanned his way into his home and made his way toward the living room to find Inko, Namuri and a voluptuous, nurse-like woman with white hair and amethyst purple eyes happily conversing while Aerie busied herself with a balloon-popping game on her tablet. Though everyone adopted smiles in response to Izuka's arrival, Aerie's lit up like the sun as she discarded her tablet, bounced to her feet, and rushed over to him, shouting, Onayakin, before hugging his waist. As it was only their second time meeting, Izuku's smile cramped when he heard Eri excitedly referring to him as her own Ichan. It didn't help that Inko, Namuri, and the strangely familiar woman all covered their mouths to stifle an amused laugh. Nim, Teyosuke Zinze. Title, Party Invitation Required. Quirk Heel, Bond Level, 66. Current Level, 51. Effective Level, 130. Attributes, Strength, 27. Agility, 28. Vitality, 592. Intelligence, 83. Dexterity, 59. Luck, 208. Free attributes, 255. Perks or party invitation required. Recognizing the name of the white-haired woman, Izuka's eyes widened as he incredulously inquired. Recovery girl sensei, while patting Ari on the head. In the flesh, replied Chio, furrowing her brows slightly as she added. And don't go getting any strange ideas, you hear? I only adopted this form in preparation for the coming crisis. My time has already come and gone. Understanding what Chio was trying to say, Izuku adopted a frown as he suppressed the urge to retort. Instead, he picked Eri up, forcing a smile as she stared intently at him with large, glistening, ruby red eyes. Shifting his attention back to the mature trio, Izuka focused his gaze on Chio as he asked, Might I ask what brings you and Amuri sensei to my home? Answering me in the duo's stead, Inko explained, Namuri sensei and I have known each other since we began our stay on the campus. We often eat lunch or work out together in the faculty gym. Since she and Chio sensei are often busy with work, I've been helping out by sitting Eri-chan for them. Nodding in affirmation, 
Namiri narrowed her piercing blue eyes in her innately sensual manner as she playfully appended. That's right. Inko-san and I have become excellent friends. After all, before this summer, there were only a handful of women among UA's faculty. It's only natural that the two of us gravitated toward one another. Though he doubted things were as straightforward as Namiri suggested, Izuku didn't press the matter. He may have if Eri wasn't present, but since she was, he responded with a curt, I see, before shifting his attention to Eri and asking, Have you met Mei yet? Forcing her eyes open with her thumbs and index fingers, Eri replied, The one he chan with the weird hair and eyes, right? Shaking his head, Izuku's expression and tone softened as he gently chided, You're not wrong, but it's not nice to refer to people as weird. Exhaling a soft gasp, Eri covered her mouth with both hands, an anxious expression developing across her face at the notion she may have done something wrong. It was a bit over the top, but Izuku was accustomed to people in the world of Boku no Hero Academia being more animated than those in his previous world. Shaking his head a second time, Izuku assured, It's okay, Eri-chan. You haven't done anything wrong just yet. Just keep in mind that there are all kinds of unique, sometimes even scary-looking individuals in this world. We must choose our words carefully, lest we inadvertently offend or hurt someone else's feelings. Uncovering her mouth, Eri regained her smile as she replied, Okay, Oni I chan Seeing the interaction between the two, Namiri clapped her hands together excitedly and exclaimed, How absolutely precious! A picture-perfect example of a reliable big brother and his adorable little sister. Though he furrowed his brows slightly, Izuku didn't bother to correct Namiri's assertion, stating, I'm going to take Eri to meet with Mei. I'll bring her back in a few minutes. Waving her hand, Inko, with a loving smile, said, No need to rush. Take your time and have fun. We'll be here when you get back. She had grown rather fond of Eri over the past couple of weeks, so it warmed her heart to see her and Izuku so close. Returning a nod, Izuku responded with a curt, See you in a bit, before carrying Eri out of the room to see what Mei was up to. In his wake, Inko, Namuri, and Shio exchanged glances, the latter eventually breaking the silence by remarking, Despite his faults, it appears your son will make an excellent father, inko -sen. Wincing at the insinuation, Inko visibly deflated as she adopted a wry smile and asked, Did you really have to say such a thing, Chiyo-sensei? Now my good mood is ruined. Hey, cheer up, said Namuri. Isn't it better that your son has a strong sense of responsibility? Things could be much, much worse, you know. Frowning deeply, Inko lowered her gaze as she muttered, I know, it's just... I can't help worrying about him. No matter how big he gets, he's still my baby. I wish he'd slow down a bit. Crossing her arms and adopting a rare expression of severity, Namuri replied, I'd agree with you in any other situation, but you've seen the news. Things aren't looking too good overseas. Many countries in the Middle East have already plunged into chaos, and Europe is struggling due to the massive influx of refugees. Your son's power is necessary to safeguard Japan and potentially the entire world. Though she didn't normally agree with Namuri, Chio nodded solemnly, adding, Things are serious enough that people from my generation are being forced out of retirement. In that regard, your son and Eri Chan are two of our greatest assets. Alleviating some of the growing tensions, Namuri narrowed her eyes at Chio specifically focusing on the much older woman's melons as she remarked. Speaking of which, I should see if Eri-chan can shave a few years off my age. I'm still in my prime, but my capabilities have declined considerably since I became a teacher. While she didn't approve of Namiri's desire to exploit Eri's power, Chio didn't try to talk her out of it. Instead, she said, Just don't go overboard. You have a great deal of fans all over the world not just Japan, so people would notice if your appearance changed drastically. Snorting through her nose, Namiri asked, What are you talking about, Chiyo-sensei? Before proudly boasting, My appearance now is virtually the same as when I was 20. Narrowing her eyes slightly, Chiyo quipped, 
I'm sure that's what you've been telling yourself. Just remember what I said, and don't go overboard trying to compete with younger women. Understanding she wouldn't be able to win an argument against Chio, Namuri shifted her attention to Inko, stating, You should also consider having Eri-chan reduce your age, Inko-san. Your quirk might not be the most effective when it comes to combat, but if you regained your prime and focused on raising your level, you could at least ensure your safety. Adopting a wry smile, Inko replied, I would be lying if I said the thought hadn't crossed my mind. However, considering the circumstances, I think it would be best if I remained as I am and avoided getting too involved in things. My son already has his attention pulled every which way. I don't want to make things even harder for him. Waving her hand, Namuri said, Don't be ridiculous, Inko-san. The higher your level, the less Izuka Cohen will worry about you. It's fine if you want to maintain your current appearance, but it would be extremely negligent of you to remain weak when your son and his adorable little sister are two of the most important people in the world. Nodding her head, Chio appended, Namuri-san is correct. You have already been made aware of the existence of All for One. You're relatively safe within the confines of UA, but it's only a matter of time before one or more villains try and target you. And not just villains, either. Once Izuka Kuin's and Eri-chan's powers become known, many will seek to use them. I speak from personal experience in that regard. Though it was only for a brief moment, a profound look of regret flashed across Chiyo's eyes. Healing quirks were the rarest and most sought after in the world, so her youth hadn't been easy. Without the protection and support of Nizu, Nana, Surahiko, Gran Torino, and countless others, she would have suffered greatly during All for One's reign. Unable to argue with the far more experienced duo, Inko eventually gave a curt nod, answering, I understand. For the sake of Izuka-chan and Eri-chan, I'll do my best to become more powerful. Nodding in approval, Namuri exclaimed, Well said. I'll inform the principal and make arrangements to have you participate in the special training of the instructors. As the vanguard against the breaches, we can't allow the students to surpass us so easily. Wasting no time, Namuri pulled out her secure phone and sent a text to Nizu. Seeing the girls from Class 1A reach level 40 plus in just a few short weeks had left her feeling a little fidgety. She had never been obsessed with strength. But there was no way she would remain level 27 while the students she had advised continued to grow stronger. To that end, she was determined to reach at least level 69 before the first breaches began to appear in Japan. Name, Namuri Kiyama. Title, Tempting Teacher. Bond plus 20, Vitality plus 50, Luck plus 50. Quirk, Somnambulist. Bond level, 100. Current level, 27. Effective level, 51. Attributes, Strength, 32. Agility, 35. Vitality, 158. Intelligence, 101. Dexterity, 105. Luck, 202. Free attributes, 0. Perks, Healthy Body, Pheromone Control, Synesthesia, Pheromone Control. The ability to amplify and manipulate one's pheromones as if they had telekinesis. Synesthesia. The ability to detect, visualize, and trace aromas. Though he felt compelled to stretch his body, Izuka briefly remained motionless after waking in his bedroom, staring at the undressed, salmon-haired girl using his chest as a pillow. Ever since the dorms were installed, May had practically been living in Izuku's workshop. More surprisingly, Inko had permitted her to use his room as if it were her own, culminating in quite a mess. As a result, dirty clothes littered the floor, and a heavy aroma of grease, oil, and ionization hung over the room. How nostalgic, thought Izuku, stirring May awake by gently pinching her nose. In and in, rising to a seated position, May stretched her upper body and issued a lengthy yawn before relaxing opening up her system window, and lazily remarking, Nine hours. I can't even remember the last time I slept that long. I usually only get around four to five hours a night, if that. Remaining on his back, Izuku asserted, 
You should take better care of yourself. Rest is important. Yeah, yeah, replied May, her expression and tone making it clear she had no intention of heeding his advice. Instead, she poked the tip of his fully macho dong, asking, I suppose it's my job to take care of this guy? Adopting a wolfish grin, Izuku replied, I certainly wouldn't mind, but it'll go down on its own once I stand up and my blood gets flowing. I'm sure you want to return to your work, so let's just get in the bath. I have exams to prepare for. Perking up, May adopted a smile of her own as she mused. Oh, if that's the case, then consider this a good luck charm. After enjoying a relaxing bath, Izuku and May made their way downstairs, finding Inko waiting with breakfast on the table. Adopting a surprisingly teasing smile, Inko mused, You're earlier than I expected. I'll just finish setting the table. While Izuku was momentarily confused by Inko's behavior, May took a seat and naturally replied, Thanks, Mrs. M. I'd probably have starved to death if not for your delicious cooking. Regaining his senses, Izuka sat next to May, adopting a wry smile as he remarked, I see the two of you have grown closer while I was away. If only you were this kind to Rumi. Furrowing her brows at the mention of Rumi, Inko's voice lowered as she asked, Speaking of which, should I begin preparing a nursery, or... Did you gain some sense while you were away? Catching Inko a little off guard, Izuka's expression became serious as he asserted, I love Rumi Kachan. She's a bit rough around the edges, but she's an excellent woman, a phenomenal hero, and a great person. Please try to get along with her. Exhaling a sigh, Inko lowered her gaze as she replied, I do not doubt that uskiyama san is a good person. It's just I heard about her condition from Namuri. I'm afraid the two of you will consume one another. Shaking his head, Izuka's expression softened as he assured, It's fine, Kachan. Rumi is a surprisingly responsible woman. One of the purposes of the training camp was to show the other girls how to balance work and play properly. She's lived her entire life regulating her condition, so she's become a fierce yet dependable older sister to the other girls. Exhaling a slightly fainter sigh, Inko replied, If you say so, sweetheart. In an unconvinced tone, she didn't appreciate how brazen Rumi was the last time they met. So it would take much more than a few sentences to convince her that the bronze-skinned bunny wasn't simply using Izuku as a convenient outlet for her desires. Seeing through Inko's thoughts, Izuku's smile became cramped at the edges. After all, while he empathized with Inko's concerns, it was a little hypocritical for her to be judgmental towards others. Making his way to the testing location, none other than his classroom, Izuku was only marginally surprised to discover nearly everyone from Class 1A present. The only people absent were Sato, Koda, and, as they had been dropped from the class, Aoyama and Mineta. Seemingly waiting for him to arrive, Toga immediately pounced on Izuku, shouting, There you are! What took you so long? I've been waiting for like two whole hours. Reciprocating the vampire-like girl's embrace, Izuku replied, I was taking it easy back at my place. You should have called or sent a text. Blinking in surprise, Toga, arms still wrapped around Izuku like a vice, asked, Is that even allowed? I thought we were only supposed to call you if it was like an emergency or something. Just try not to make a habit of it, replied Izuku punctuating his words with a chase kiss. Toga tried pursuing his lips when he pulled away, but she was unsuccessful due to the difference in their heights. Then, before Ida or Momo could chastise them, Izuka softly mused, what well, we should be concerned with our public displays of affection while on campus. Just take a look around. Heeding Izuka's words, Toga looked around to find virtually everyone in the classroom staring at them. This included Momo, who, contrasting her usual bubbliness, had a serious, business-like expression on her face as she observed them with crossed arms. There is a time and a place for everything, remarked Momo, exuding the aura of a serious class representative as she added. You would both do well to keep that in mind. Releasing her hold on Izuku, albeit reluctantly, Toga adopted an awkward smile, rubbing the back of her head as she replied, Sorry, Momo-chan. 
I just got caught up in the moment. Folding her hands over her lap, Toga bowed toward the rest of the class, adding, Please forgive me, everyone. Responding before anyone else, Kirishima waved his hand and said, Hey, it's no big deal. We're all pretty nervous, so having someone to shatter the tension is good. Snorting through his nose, the nearby Bakugo defiantly retorted, Speak for yourself, hedgehog. I'm not even remotely nervous. Directing his gaze to Izuku, Bakugo added, What I want to know is what you assholes were doing these past few weeks. I busted my butt off and only gained a single level. Now, even the droopy-eared emo girl is level 42. What the hell happened? Raising his brows, Izuku was momentarily confused before remembering that Bakugo wasn't in the main class chat. He had already explained the situation to everyone else. So it was Kirishima who replied, Oh, they were conducting an experiment with the experience sharing function. And don't let the difference in level bother you too much. It takes the same amount of experience to go from 40 to 41 as it does from 30 to 40. So there isn't as big a gap as you might expect. Glaring at Kirishima, Bakugo exclaimed, Who's worried? Besides, it's not like levels are everything. Except for the broccoli-headed cheat and that icy hot bastard. None of you can do jack shit about my explosion quirk. Exhaling a faint sigh through his nose, Kirishima, maintaining a friendly smile, casually remarked, Your quirk isn't the only thing that's explosive about you, man. We're going to be classmates from now on. Can't you at least pretend to get along with everyone? Clicking his tongue, Bakugo turned away and rose to his feet, muttering, Whatever. As he slipped his hands into his pockets, and made his way outside for some fresh air. Along the way, he directed his carmine gaze to Izuku, narrowing his eyes but ultimately choosing to remain silent. Entering the classroom at precisely 7 a.m., Aizawa lazily cast his gaze over everyone, narrowing his eyes as he remarked, There's more of you than I anticipated. You realize that if you fail these exams, you won't be able to take them again for an entire year, right? If you're not confident, spare me the effort of having to grade your papers by leaving now. Wait, seriously? exclaimed Kaminari, one of the lowest scores in the entire class. He also hadn't received the boon of having his intelligence boosted, so there was no way he could pass the CBEs. He only showed up because virtually everyone else did. Meeting Kaminari's gaze, Aizawa lazily replied, That's right. Leave now and you'll have another opportunity at the start of the third term. Though, if everyone else were to pass, there's a chance you'd end up as one of the only students still taking general education classes. Opening his mouth, Kaminari wanted to say something, but found himself at a complete and utter loss for words. He wouldn't mind some one-on-one -on -one lessons with Midnight, but the thought of receiving guided instruction from Aizawa and his other senseis caused a cold sweat to break across his body. Cradling his head with both hands, Kaminari despaired. Why did I ally myself with that grape-headed bastard? Ignoring Kaminari's lamentations, Aizawa passed his languid gaze over the rest of the class. Except for Todoroki, who consistently sported an apathetic look. Everyone else had determined expressions. Some were clearly more prepared and confident than the rest. But no one was willing to give up without giving it their all. Well, don't say I didn't warn you, said Aizawa, opening up the manila folder he had carried into the classroom and instructing Momo and Izuku to pass around the first exam, third year English. Ordinarily, they would start with second year material, but considering virtually everyone in the class had genius level intellect, Nizu had arranged it so that they would only pass if they completed the entire curriculum. That was easier than I expected, remarked Siu, sitting with the rest of the girls during their lunch break. Really? asked Achiko, looking a bit worse for wear, as she forced a wry smile and added, I feel like my brain is beginning to melt. Nodding her head, Kyoka added, No kidding. If we didn't bust our butts off at Okinoshima, there's no way we could pass these exams. Hearing Kyoka's utterance, the grim expression on Toga's face became even more prominent. She had studied diligently over the past few weeks, but like many others, she had mainly focused on the second-year course material. 
She may have been able to pull off a passing grade if they were taking ordinary exams, but the base requirement for the CBEs was 95%. Noticing Toga's expression, Momo adopted an assuring smile as she said, If it's any consolation, Toga-san, most of us intend to continue attending classes when we're not busy with work studies. If you need help studying in the future, please do not hesitate to rely on me. Perking up at the mention of work studies, Toga pumped her fists and exclaimed, Oh yeah, there's still the provisional licensing exam in two days. If I can get my provisional hero license, I can skip as many classes as I like. That's right, replied Mina, having already given up on passing the CBEs. She was doing better than expected, but she knew there was no way she would score 95% in every subject. Only monsters and genuinely studious people could pull that off with limited preparation time. As both a monster and a genuinely studious person, Momo was a little taken aback by the relief everyone showed in response to Toga's and Mina's words. They had covered the entire curriculum during their stay on Okinoshima. So while she didn't anticipate perfect scores from everyone, she expected they would all pass. Unfortunately, when the final scores were posted the following day, the only people who scored above 95% in every category were herself and Izuku. With the provisional licensing exam taking place the following day, Izuku was planning to take it easy, spend some time with his mom, and practice his bass guitar. Instead, shortly after the email disclosing the CBE results came out, he received a message from Nizu asking him to come in. Contrasting the cordial smile on the diminutive Chimera's face, Izuku had a somewhat weary expression as he remarked, No rest for the wicked. Amused by Izuku's greeting, Nizu exhaled a light-hearted laugh before regaining his smile and musing, Congratulations on passing your CBEs, Midoriya-kun. It's a shame only one other student from your class scored a passing grade. Yayiro-san is quite exceptional, isn't she? You're not wrong, replied Izuku, narrowing his eyes slightly as he added. But it was a bit mean-spirited of you to make them take the third-year exams. Without my eidetic memory and Momo's encyclopedic knowledge perk allowing her to catalog and store information in her mind, we might not have passed. Shrugging his shoulders... Nizu responded with a casual perhaps, before adding, Fortunately, you once again met my expectations. Had you failed, I would have needed to pull some strings to ensure you have the freedom you need in the coming months. Closing his eyes and exhaling a faintly exasperated sigh through his nose, Izuka muttered, I figured you were up to something, before opening his eyes and asking, Should I thank you? In a sardonic tone. If you'd like, replied Nizu. Things would be much more difficult for you if you had to tend to your growing number of companions. This way, you can focus on preparing for the meta-world transversal phenomenon while they train alongside your classmates or focus on their work studies. Is that all? Asked Izuku, knowing there was something more due to how happy Nizu seemed. Raising his brows, Nizu asked, Have I perhaps wronged you in some way, Midoriyakin? Given the circumstances, I believe this was, at the very least, the most prudent course of action. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted it's fine. I just don't approve of you regarding the girls as a distraction. They're bound to fight alongside me once the meta-world transversal phenomenon reaches our shores. So I'd prefer you to show them the same concern you afford me. Nodding in affirmation, Nizu adopted a serious expression as he replied, I'll be certain to keep that in mind from now on. For now, however, there is a matter I require your assistance with. Returning a nod of his own, Izuku remarked, I suspected as much from the start. As much as you appear to enjoy forcing others to come to you, you wouldn't have called me here simply to congratulate me on my exam results. Regaining his smile, Niz amused, that's debatable. However, in this particular instance, you are correct. You see, I've been called to speak at the forthcoming United Nations Summit meeting. Ordinarily, I would never leave the Academy grounds, much less Japan, but this is a request from the Prime Minister and the Director of the Heroes Association. More to the point, I'd like you to come with me. Raising his brows, Izuku incredulously inquired. You want me, a student, to attend a meeting of world leaders? 
Heavens no, responded Nizu. I'll be attending the summit alone, but there are some people I'd like to introduce you to during our stay in New York. More specifically, I have arranged to have you meet with Kathleen Bate and Historia Pendragon, the other two holders of actualization-type quirks. Ah, so you want me to use digitalization to try and analyze their quirks? Asked Izuku. Yes and no, replied Nizu. While it's true I'd like you to analyze their quirks, the purpose of your meeting is more straightforward. Alongside little Ms. Chisaki, the three of you are among the world's most powerful assets. You will likely be fighting alongside one another in the future, so you should, at the very least, be aware of one another. Though he suspected Nizu wasn't telling him everything, Izuku would be lying if he said the prospect of returning to America didn't excite him. He was also curious to know the levels and parameters of two of the world's most powerful heroes. So he replied, I understand. I'll accompany you to America. Splendid, replied Nizu, adopting a genuine smile as he added. We'll be departing five days from now alongside Tashinori Quinn and Ms. Shield. Her father will be meeting us in New York. Furrowing his brows, Izuku asked, What about Eri and my mother? If Tashinori leaves Japan, they could become targets of you-know-who and the less understanding members of the Shai Hasaikai. Mm. Adopting a thoughtful expression, Nizu remarked, I'd like to say they're safe within the school grounds, but I can understand your concerns. If it puts your mind at ease, they're welcome to accompany us during our trip overseas. Just know that America is far more dangerous than Japan. Even if they remain in the hotel, there's no guarantee they'll be safe. New York has innumerable heroes, but it's also the place powerful villains go to try and make a name for themselves. Recalling the incident that occurred at Eye Island, Izuku's frown deepened. The soundest course of action was to leave Tashinori behind or have him directly safeguard them, but that was a double-edged sword. He was the most recognizable hero in the entire world. So if people saw him actively protecting two civilians, news organizations and villains alike would spare no effort to uncover their identities or target them. Seeing through Izuka's thoughts, Nisa mused, Worry not. With all our recent hires and the upgrades to our security system, I dare say UA is as secure as I Island and Tartarus. As an extra precaution, however, I will arrange to have your mother and Ms. Chisaki reside in a safe house while we're away. Would that be acceptable? Suppressing a sigh, Izuka nodded and replied, so long as they're safe. In a weary tone, he hated having to worry about others, but that was the price heroes paid for having companions and close, familial bonds. Then we've nothing left to discuss, said Nizu. I will notify you of the specifics of our travel arrangements the morning of our departure. Rest well now, and good luck with the provisional licensing exam. I've made arrangements to ensure you receive your license, regardless of how well you do on the exam, but I imagine you'd like to participate and help your classmates. Seriously? Asked Izuku, shaking his head before Nizu could respond. Forget it. With the world's fate on the line, it wouldn't make much sense to restrict me because of a licensing issue. I'm more interested to know what you have planned for my work studies. Knowing you, you must have something in mind. Perking up, Nizu happily mused, three things actually. Would you like to discuss them now? Might as well, replied Izuku. I mean, I'm already here. Very well then, hummed Nizu explaining, first and foremost, you will be conducting your work studies as an apprentice hero under Tashinori Kuen. Secondly, I was planning to send the two of you to Europe. There is substantial pressure to have Tasha Nori on the front lines. So if you choose to accompany him, you will attend Britain's Royal Academy of Heroics as an exchange student until breaches begin to appear in Japan. Before Izuku could interrupt him, Nizu raised his hand, silencing him as he said, the Royal Academy is about to introduce a program that would allow their top students entry into the breaches. Members of the program are called Knights, and the top 13 students are assigned code names that correspond to individuals from Arthurian legend. If you're willing, I'd like you to become a member of the Round Table, spending the next few months, quite literally, gaining experience within the breaches. Though he was interested in investigating the breaches, 
Izuka couldn't help reaching up to massage his forehead when he heard what Nizu was asking of him. It likely wouldn't be more than two to three months, but that was a long time to be away from his family, his girlfriends, and the mother of his unborn child. Not as long as the average tour of duty, but still, observing Izuku's reaction, the smile faded from Nizu's face, replaced by a slight frown. Fortunately, before his expectations could be undermined fully, Izuku exhaled a sigh and responded with an exasperated, Fine. I'll go to Europe. Excellent, replied Nizu, regaining his smile as he said, I wouldn't have condemned you if you declined my proposal, but with the current state of our world, I'm afraid we can't afford to remain idle. Your power clearly has some sort of connection with the breaches, so it's important for you to be proactive in their investigation. Standing a little straighter, Izuka's expression gained a hint of severity as he replied, I understand. I will do my best to uncover their source so that we might bring an end to them. Permanently, regaining his smile, Niza said, Thank you, Midoriya. I know this is a lot to ask of you, but there are no others that can bear this burden in your stead. Tashinori Kuen and I will continue to support you, but he's unable to enter the breaches, and I'm better suited to administrative tasks. The only people who can uncover the connection between those with actualization quirks and the breaches are those who possess them. I understand, repeated Izuku, knowing better than Nizu how vital his role in the coming events was. He didn't know for certain if this was one of his trials, but he would have to be a complete ignoramus to dismiss the possibility outright. Then I will make the necessary arrangements, said Nizu. Please enjoy these next five days, as you will likely be heading to London immediately following the summit. Furrowing his brows, Izuku wanted to say that five days wasn't enough time to prepare, but knowing that hundreds of thousands had already lost their lives to the breaches, the words failed to reach his lips. Instead, he bowed his head, responding with yet another, I understand, before eventually departing Nizu's office in a daze. Instead of returning to his home and taking it easy, Izuku accessed the roof of UA's main building, sitting on its edge and staring at the horizon with a distant look in his eyes. He was more annoyed than troubled by his impending transfer, but, as a soldier, he was willing to do what he must to protect those he cared about. If not for his mother, the girls, and Rumi, he wouldn't hesitate to head to London right then and there. Quite the place you found for yourself. I hope you're not thinking about jumping, joked a familiar voice, emanating a few meters behind Izuku. Turning his head, Izuku adopted a faint but genuine smile as he said, Long time no see, old man. Exhaling a throaty chuckle, Tashinori made his way over to Izuku, taking a seat next to him before saying, I just finished speaking with the principal. Are you really okay with this? Nodding his head, Izuku replied, even before I accepted the burden of one for all, I was determined to do what I could to protect this world and its people, not just those close to me. Now, more than ever, I want to fight to protect this world's future. Understanding the meaning of Izuku's words, Tashinori's smile became somewhat awkward as he asked, I suppose some congratulations are in order? Nodding a second time, Izuku's smile became affectionate as he affirmed, Rumi is pregnant. According to her doctor, I'll be a father in the next five to six months. So soon? Asked Tashinori, his expression revealing his incredulity. Exhaling a light chuckle, Izuku remarked, I was just as surprised as you are. According to Rumi, her mother was only pregnant with her for around 19 weeks. Part of being a rabbit, I guess. Placing his hand on Izuku's shoulder, Tashinori adopted a toothy smile as he said, then, no matter what, let's be sure to return before then. Returning a toothy grin of his own, Izuku added, Emphasis on the word us. I'm planning to make you my children's godfather, so you'll need to be present as well. Blinking in surprise, Tashinori paused for a moment before adopting an even bigger smile and responding, It would be my honor, in a voice that seemed to carry across the campus simultaneously erasing the wind chill that had permeated Izuku's body. With only five days until his departure to the States, Izuku had little time to get his affairs in order.
Thus, shortly after separating from Tashinori, he pulled out his cell phone, asking the girls if they could meet him back at the dorms so he could explain things in person. Fortunately for Izuku, even Toga had moved into the dorms the previous afternoon, so all seven girls were waiting in his living room, having made themselves comfortable by the time he arrived. Similar to the previous day, Toga charged at Izuka the moment he arrived, pouncing on him excitedly as she exclaimed, Congratulations on passing your exams! Though he hadn't had much time to familiarize himself with Toga, Izuku wrapped his arms around her, reciprocating her embrace and responding, Thanks, Himiko! Blinking in surprise, Toga looked up at Izuku with a hint of conflict in her carmine eyes. She wasn't particularly fond of her given name, as it made her sound like a princess, but she had misgivings about correcting Izuku since it was a form of endearment. Seeing through Toga's thoughts, Izuku raised his brows and asked, Should I keep calling you Toga? Adopting a somewhat scary smile, Toga linked her arms around Izuku's shoulders as she licked her lips and replied, If it's you, you can call me anything you like, so long as I get to call you mine. Undaunted by Toga's fangs, Izuka bent forward to reward her with a kiss, this time holding it much longer than their previous exchanges. Then, with his hand on her waist, he guided her back to the others, taking a seat and allowing her to snuggle up next to him as he recounted everything he had discussed with Nizu. Unsurprisingly, none of the girls were enthused by the notion he would be away for upwards of three months. Toga, in particular, had a borderline murderous look on her face as she softly griped. That damned mascot. Patting the golden-haired girl's hand, resting on his inner thigh, Izuku passed his gaze over everyone. His expression and tone soft yet assured as he said, the meta-world transveral phenomenon threatens to engulf the entire world. If I can help uncover the truth of its origin and find a way to stop it, millions if not billions of lives would be saved. Getting straight to the heart of the matter, Achiko asked, Can't we come with you? Instead of refusing outright, Izuku asked, Are you prepared to leave your family and friends, travel to another country, and put your life on the line? Catching Izuku a little off guard, Achiko held her hands up, balling them in a fist as she replied, You said it yourself. The entire world is in peril. If I can help, even just a little, I want to give it my all. Right on, Achiko-chan, exclaimed Mina, throwing her right fist into the air as she appended. Europe, here we come. Recovering from his momentary stupor, an affectionate smile developed across Izuka's face as he met the resolute gazes of Tsu, Kyoka, Mina, and Momo, asking. I'm guessing you all feel the same way. Returning one of her characteristically luminous smiles, Momo replied. We promise to stay together. Besides, everyone here aspires to be a great hero someday. We can't simply remain idle while the man we love travels abroad to fight the common enemy of humanity. Before any of the other girls could respond, Toga issued a loud groan, her expression and tone suffused with lamentation as she whined. This isn't fair. There's no way my parents will let me go to Europe to fight a bunch of monsters. With Toga's words reminding them of the reality of the situation, the looks on everyone's faces, sans Momo, visibly cramped. There was no way they could leave the country of their own accord. So if their parents refused to let them go, their hands were tied. Exhaling a faint sigh through his nose, Izuka's expression softened as he said, I'll be returning the moment the breaches start to appear in Japan. For now, it's probably for the best that you all remain here focusing on your training and work studies. I'll have all might watching over me, so I'll be fine. Hanging her head, Achiko adopted a particularly somber expression as she muttered, Everyone should fight together. And we will, replied Izuku, adding, But at least for now, we still have duties and obligations as students. My situation makes me an exception, but without the backing of the principal and Tashinori, even I wouldn't be able to enter the breaches of another country. As dangerous as they are, the resources found within make them a gold mine. Raising her face, Achiko muttered, I get that, but still, the thought of you fighting alone makes me uncomfortable. Chiming into the conversation, Toru casually remarked, 
Eh, I doubt he'll be alone. I'm more concerned about other women sinking their teeth into him while he's away. Staring at Izuku, Toru suggested, You should take Melissa or Momo with you. I'm fine with sharing you with everyone here, but things will become complicated if we start including girls from other countries. Humoring the idea, Izuka looked to Momo, asking, How about it? Think your parents would allow it? Certainly, replied Momo, adopting a charming smile as she appended. The two of us are affianced, so our fates are already tied as one. The only issue is the timing. I won't be able to accompany you to New York, but I should be able to meet you in London. Adopting a smile of his own, Izuka looked around, asking, Is that okay with everyone here? I don't see any issues with it, said Siyu. Same here, replied Mina. With Izuku setting his gaze on her, Achiko forced a smile as she replied, I'd prefer it if I were the one to go with you, but this is better than you going alone. Just try not to bring back any British girls, teased Toru. It's fine if you get frisky with a few, but try not to let things get serious. Furrowing his brows, Izuku felt compelled to defend himself. But as it was much too late to change everyone's perception with words, he ultimately remained silent. Action spoke louder than words, so the best thing he could do for himself was not have any casual relationships while abroad. Fortunately, as long as Momo received permission to accompany him, that shouldn't be an issue. Inserting herself into the dialogue, utterly derailing things, Toga had a serious look on her face as she said, Let's do it. Right here, right now. Before Izuku could respond, Toru raised her hand and said, Oh, oh, count me in. If we only have five days left, we should put them to use. Adopting a chiding tone, Momo expressed, While I understand your urgency, it wouldn't be wise to exert ourselves before the provisional licensing exam. If we fail to obtain our licenses, we may not be able to enter the breaches, even when they reach Japan. I don't care asserted Toga. Everyone else has had the chance to be with Izuku. It's my turn. Exhaling a faint sigh, Momo's tone softened as she said, I'm not saying you can't, only that you shouldn't. At the very least, you should wait until the exam is finished. After that, you can do as you please. Understanding that Momo's position was higher than hers, Toga clenched her teeth but didn't argue. Instead, she looked up at Izuku pleading with her eyes for him to speak in her defense. Returning a smile, Izuka planted a kiss atop Toga's head before saying, There's more to being in a relationship than shabowinking. You're welcome to stay here the rest of the day, and even spend the night, though she would have preferred it if Izuku had instructed her to lie down and spread her legs. Toga regained a smile as she snuggled up to him and replied, Then that's what I'll do. Ihihi. This girl definitely has a few screws loose, thought Izuku. However, as he had already decided to accept Toga into his harem, he just shook his head in mock exasperation before extending the same invitation to everyone else. Momo briefly excused herself to contact her parents and grandfather, but she eventually returned to join everyone amid a game of strip twister, with the girls convincing him to let them test the results of their training without his oversight. Izuko ultimately decided against participating in the provisional licensing exam. Instead, he spent much of the day with Inko, accompanying her to a day spa and visiting a local shrine. Unsurprisingly, Inko wasn't very happy to learn of Izuka's forthcoming departure, but she didn't attempt to talk him out of going. She knew how important he was, so throughout their impromptu date, she wore a bright smile and didn't broach the subject even a single time. She did, however, offer up a prayer for him at the shrine, petitioning the gods to watch over him and ensure he returns safely. After that, the two of them returned home, eating dinner together before Izuku returned to his dorm to spend time with the girls, including Melissa and May. Thousands of kilometers from Japan, a young woman with a slender physique, fair skin, green eyes, and pale blonde hair fastened into a modified crown braid stared listlessly at a circular blue portal framed by crackling energy. Next to her, a petite, almost dwarf-like girl with a large backpack, cerulean blue eyes, and inordinately long, pale brown pigtails remarked, Based on these mana readings, 
This appears to be a B-rank breach. The average level of the monsters within should be around 72, but the boss could be as high as 99. I see, replied the blonde-haired girl, extending her right hand to sink her fingertips into the cold surface of the portal, as she added. Then I shall return within the hour. Furrowing her brows, the pigtailed, bespectacled girl asked, Shouldn't we inform your father, Sir Pendragon? He'll draw and quarter me if he learns I let you enter a breach on your own. Adopting a faint smile, the blonde-haired girl softly replied, Father isn't such a cruel man, Bedivere. So long as we return triumphantly, he will not admonish us. With the blonde-haired girl utilizing her codename, Bedivere knew she couldn't be talked out of entering the breach. The former was the type who, once they had made up their mind, followed through to the end, no matter the consequences. Exhaling a tired sigh, Bedivere pressed two tiny buttons on the palms of her gloves, causing large mechanical arms to emerge from the top of her backpack. Since she couldn't stop her friend from doing as she pleased, all she could do was support her, groaning, I hope it's not hoggoblins or changelings. Looking back at her diminutive companion, the blonde-haired girl mused, You need not accompany me, Beatty. I am more than capable of clearing a breach of this magnitude on my own. Narrowing her eyes, Bedivere replied, Can it, Arthur? I'm coming with you, and that's final. Besides, I want to increase my level a bit before we go to New York. I don't trust those Yanks as far as I can throw them. With your silver arms, that's quite far, mused the blonde-haired girl, codenamed Arthur. She was the top-ranking student at Britain's Royal Academy of Heroics, and her father was the headmaster. As such, even though the Knights of the Round Table had yet to be implemented, she had taken to calling herself Arthur, borrowing the name of her legendary forebear. Wasting no more time, a bluish-white light enveloped Arthur's body from the neck down, culminating in the appearance of silvery-white armor and a royal blue battle dress. At the same time, she manifested a broadsword with a cross-shaped guard in her right hand, its handle more than a meter in length and its blade exceeding three. Yet despite this, she wielded it as if it weighed no more than a feather. Feeling lonesome? Asked Nizu, seated across from Izuku in the back of Melissa's stealth jet. Without diverting his gaze from the window, Izuku replied, something like that, in a noncommittal tone. Well... If you're looking for a distraction, why not ask Ms. Melissa to teach you how to fly? Asked Nizu, adding, You never know when such a skill might come in handy. Though he would have jumped at such an opportunity in his previous life, Izuku didn't hesitate to reply. Pass. I'm not really in the mood to learn a new skill right now, and I don't want to distract her. Then, perhaps you'd like to join me for a game of Go? Asked Nizu. I'll give you a handicap. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, I've never played before, and I'm not in the mood to have my but handed to me. Shifting his gaze to the diminutive chimera, Izuku asked, Leaving the campus makes you nervous, doesn't it? Forcing a smile, Nizu replied, Indeed. I'd rather not go into the details, but the United States is where I was born and experimented upon. The people responsible have already been brought to justice but I always feel a sense of unease whenever I return. Raising his brows, Izuku remarked, That came out of nowhere. Shrugging his shoulders, Niz amused, Consider it an attempt to improve my bond level. The sooner I become a member of your party, the sooner I can power level. It's a shame that setting traps, employing robots, and utilizing conventional weapons doesn't increase experience directly. It can increase your attributes, though, said Izuku. That's important, as raising your base level awards you attributes based on your proficiencies. If you don't actively work to improve your physique, most of the attributes you gain from leveling will go directly into your intelligence. Nodding his head, Nizu replied, Yes, I read your report. However, while I am fascinated by the notion of being able to smash through walls or move around at high speeds, I intend to focus on my intelligence. It's what has defined me and allowed me to survive till now. Just be sure to put a few points into vitality, said Izuku. 
There are a lot of incredible perks, but I recommend Healthy Body to everyone. I'll be sure to keep that in mind, replied Nizu. However, my plan is to specialize in perks pertaining to the intelligence attribute. Who knows, there may even be an omniscience perk at higher values. If there is, it would probably require base intelligence of a million, if not much higher, expressed Izuku. Tashinori had access to some pretty ridiculous perks, but nothing that would make him truly godlike. Well, we'll see what's available when the time comes, mused Nizu. For now, let's review the files of the representatives that will be attending the summit. Due to your association with myself and Tashinori Kuen, there's a reasonably high probability that people from various countries will try to approach you. Even China has sent a delegation this time, so we must be especially cautious of their enforcers. Activating a tiny holographic projector, a trio of profiles appeared in the air between Nizu and Izuku. One depicted a square-faced man with fierce red eyes, peppered hair with two tufts resembling horns, and a countenance that looked like he really needed to take a crap. The other two images depicted comparably youthful-looking individuals possessing long black hair that framed their faces, ponytails, sharp black eyes, and inordinately fair, almost glossy skin. Izuka was sure that at least one of them was a man, but it was difficult to tell at a glance. This is the chairperson of the Chinese Enforcement Division, Gong Bao, and his twin grandchildren, Gong Li and Gong Yun, explained Nizu. The Gong family is one of the four great guardian houses of China, charged with defending the East. As such, they are more than a little antagonistic toward Japan. Raising his brows, Izuku asked, Do you really think they would attack us at a gathering of world leaders? It wouldn't be the first time, replied Nizu. Assassination attempts and villain attacks are remarkably common during summit meetings, even in times of peace. There are a disheartening number of people who believe they can leave their name and mark on history by perpetrating egregious crimes, especially in fame-obsessed countries like America. Shaking his head and exhaling an exasperated sigh, Nizu added, Things were especially troublesome near the outset of the Cork Wars. In-person meetings between world leaders had to be suspended entirely as terrorist organizations from across the world attempted to eliminate everyone in a position of power and authority. The amount of history and culture we lost during those times, Haya, though he wasn't human, Niza cherished knowledge more than anything else. Those that went around destroying landmarks, attacking museums or burning books, all in an attempt to rewrite or erase history, were among the people he hated the most. Regaining his smile, Niza looked up at Izuku as he said, Anyways, it's a good habit to always be on your guard. The likelihood of the Gong twins attacking you directly is slim, but never zero. Fortunately, we have quite a bit of information on their capabilities. Gong Li can create creatures and constructs from golden flames, while his sister, Gong Yun, can do much the same with ice. They are also renowned for their swordsmanship and hand-to-hand -hand capabilities, so be wary. Exhaling a sigh of his own, Izuku pointedly remarked, You realize if this were a novel or a video game, warning me to be wary virtually guarantees that they'll attack. Right? I'd appreciate it if you didn't go around planting troublesome flags. Did your intuition trigger? Asked Nizu. No answered Izuku. But it's better to be safe than sorry. Just let me review the files on my own. Either that, or you could tell me more about Kathleen Bate and Historia Pendragon. There's a ton of information online about the former, but I couldn't find anything on Historia. That's because there's a super injunction preventing publication related to her, revealed Nizu, simultaneously inputting a command into his palm-sized projector to bring up a strangely familiar image of a girl with blonde hair and green eyes. This is Britain's number one hero? Asked Izuku. She looks even younger than me. Yes and no, replied Nizu. The Pendragon most people know is her father, but Ms. Historia is set to inherit the title once she graduates from the Royal Academy. Before Izuku could ask for clarification, Nizu waggled his finger and said, Patience, young Midoriya. 
Please reserve all questions until the very end of my explanation. Though he furrowed his brows, Izuku remained silent, permitting Nizu to state, As the inheritor of one for all, I'm sure you're aware of the notion that quirks possess wills, correct? The quirk of the Pendragons embodies this principle as it chooses its successor, fusing with their inborn quirk to become more powerful with each generation. Miss Historia is set to be the fifth Pendragon, inheriting the title from her father, who in turn inherited it from his mother. As for the true name of the quirk, adopting an amused smile, Nizu revealed, it is apparently known as Lord of Camelot, Artorius. It is for this reason that the Pendragons are referred to as such. A hundred years ago, they were a relatively unknown family from Sweden, distantly descended from the Celts. They're one of many families that rose to prominence during the Quirk Wars, eventually becoming an extension of the British royal family. I'm surprised they didn't vie for the throne, said Izuku. If memory serves, Arthurian legend states that King Arthur would one day return, reuniting the British Isles and forming a utopian society. Nodding his head, knees amused, they very well might have if not for the accusations of other nobles and the general illegitimacy of their claim to the throne. As far as most people are concerned, King Arthur was simply that a legend. There is very little evidence of his existence, and there are no recorded records of his lineage. Miss Historia does have a claim to the throne, but she is 73rd in the line of succession. Wasn't their quirk able to teleport people around? Asked Izuku. With an ability like that, it shouldn't be that difficult to get rid of the competition. Perhaps, replied Nizu. But murdering their detractors wouldn't inspire confidence in the notion that they're building a utopia. Rather, most of the world would regard them as tyrants. Keying something into his projector, Nizu brought up what looked like a class seating chart depicting 24 people. Before Izuku could ask, Nizu explained, these are the students most likely to enter the breaches alongside you in the future. Most are the sons and daughters of various nobles, but there are a few exchange students, such as yourself. Noticing his profile pic among the second row of images, Izuku furrowed his brows and asked, Why does it say Green Knight under my photo? Is that meant to be my codename? This list was pulled from the Royal Academy's servers, revealed Nizu. And yes... That is the code name that Ms. Historia has assigned you. If I'm not mistaken, it originates from a fable related to Sir Gawain, one of King Arthur's nephews. Looking beneath Historia's image and noticing she had assigned herself the code name Arthur, Izuka deadpanned as he muttered, It appears the next generation Pendragon has a serious case of Chinibio syndrome. Exhaling an amused chuckle, Nizu remarked, Funnily enough, I had the same thought when I first delved into the Royal Academy servers and learned this information. According to her father, Ms. Historia has always been a very imaginative young lady. She's also known to be able to ascertain a person's true nature, however, so you should be careful when you meet. Why? asked Izuku, genuinely confused by Nisa's warning. It wasn't like he was a bad person. Ms. Historia has been targeted by villains and terrorists since she was a child explained Nizu. She is very cautious of others, and her father, Sir Arcturus Pendragon, is very protective of his daughter. If she determines you are a threat, you will likely be ousted from the academy and forced to return to Japan. Talk about shelter, remarked Izuku, shaking his head as he added. Well, it should be fine. I'm more concerned that Momo isn't among the students listed here. Were you unable to process or transfer? I'm afraid that Ms. Yairozu will not be attending the Royal Academy of Heroics as a student, replied Nizu, promptly clarifying. Instead, she will be accompanying you as a personal attendant. You would be looked down upon if you attended the Royal Academy without one. So Ms. Yairozu volunteered herself for the position. Seriously? asked Izuku. What kind of academy requires students to bring servants? That's just... Shrugging his shoulders, Nizu replied... There are similar schools here in Japan. The children of high-ranking executives and politicians are often the targets of villains, so they generally have one or more attendants to see to their needs and keep them safe. 
I was originally going to ask Ms. Sosaki from the wild, wild pussycats to accompany you, but this was a far more convenient option. Imagining Shino in a maid outfit, Izuku internally remarked, damn, while outwardly responding, I see, but shouldn't Momo be fairly well known among the super elite? She also appeared during the UA Sports Festival. Precisely, replied Nizu. The Yairosa family is one of the wealthiest in the entire world. Once it becomes known that your attendant is the sole daughter of such a reputable family, your standing will be elevated quite a bit. This is the intent of Yairosa's grandfather, so I advise you to play along and accept that you're now a part of the super elite yourself. Though he furrowed his brows, Izuku didn't attempt to deny Nizu's words. He often forgot, but he was a multi-billionaire with some of the world's most powerful and influential backers. As an aspiring paragon and the successor of one for all, he was also fated to save the world or die trying, so lying low was no longer an option. That ship set sail the moment he ingested one of Tashinori's distinctly golden hair follicles. Around two hours into the intercontinental flight, Melissa's voice came over the intercom, stating, Principal Nizu, our escort has arrived. Would you like to address them? Certainly, replied Nizu, pulling out an earpiece fitted for his distinctly angular ears while Izuka looked out the window to find what looked like a squadron of B-2 stealth bombers. More surprisingly, an inordinately tall, muscular, and blonde-haired woman was standing atop one, waving her hand and seemingly glowing against the backdrop of the early morning sky. Recognizing the woman as America's number one hero, stars and stripes, Izuka couldn't help wondering what kind of product she used to maintain her hairstyle while standing on the back of a jet. More importantly, as they were only separated by a pane of nearly indestructible glass, he was able to get a look at her stats. Name, Kathleen Bate. Title, Faith's Champion. Vitality plus 500. Quirk, New Order. Bond level, 83. Current level, 193. Effective level, 3,596. Attributes, strength, 12,339. Agility, 5,004. Vitality, 13,811. Intelligence, 85. Dexterity, 4,177. Luck, 553. Free Attributes, 745. Perks, Avatar of Faith, Spirit of the Indomitable, Authority False. Skills, Righteous Fury, Bash, Haste, Mighty Guard, Sacrifice, Pain Splitting. Avatar of Faith, Chosen of the Seven Virtues. Able to wield divine energy to shield allies and smite foes. Spirit of the Indomitable. Immune to psychological attacks and debuffs. Authority false. Blessed by Telania. Able to influence the world around you and resist the power of foreign authorities within an enemy domain. Righteous Fury. Deals purifying damage based on the damage you have sustained from a particular target. Bash. Stuns or disorients a target with a mighty blow. Mighty Guard. Reduces physical, magical, and spiritual damage taken by half. Sacrifice. Take attacks on behalf of a specified target. Pain splitting. Transfer injuries to a willing target. Holy shit! Thought Izuku, his eyes darting between Kathleen's title, perks, and skills. He had expected her to be powerful, but it was apparent she had been farming breaches. A base level of 193 wasn't impossible to attain. But Kathleen hadn't become a hero until she joined the Air Force at 18. She needed authorization from her chain of command to act or engage a threat, so there was no way she could attain a triple-digit level when most other active heroes were between the levels of 30 and 60. Interrupting Izuku's train of thought, Nizu said, Our friends from the United States Air Force will be escorting us to a private airfield near West Point Academy. Even with our reduced airspeed, we should reach it within the hour. You'd think with a country the size of the US, their number one hero would have better things to do than play escort, remarked Izuku, making sure to face away from the window, so Kathleen wouldn't be able to read his lips. 
Adopting an amused smile, Nizu remarked, as popular as all might is in the States, his power is comparable to that of a super weapon. In other words, we aren't being escorted for our protection, but to ensure we don't deviate from our flight plan. Sounds about right, muttered Izuku, shaking his head before adding, still, it's a little over the top. Ignoring the atmospheric chill and wind pressure, standing on the back of a stealth fighter seems like a good way to eat a swarm of insects. Have you experienced something similar? Asked Nizu, perking up out of curiosity. Shaking his head, Izuku replied, Not yet, but since I have flowed among my unawakened quirks, I put a fair amount of thought into the banes and boons of aerial mobility. How prudent, mused Nizu, following it up by remarking, I've seen the prototype from Alyssa's Sky Regalia. It's quite the marvel of technology, as expected from David Shield's daughter. Exhaling a tired smile, Izuku appended, It's too bad I can't make use of them. When I move around at high speeds, an invisible membrane forms around my limbs, decreasing my friction coefficient and reducing the effects of wind pressure. The sky reglia's core requires that pressure to function properly, so the technology used is better suited to increasing the range of aircraft than enabling individuals to glide freely through the sky. I'm sure the two of you will figure something out, mused Nizu, adding, who knows, perhaps the materials you harvest within the breaches will provide a solution? Researchers at Eye Island have been studying a power source dubbed mana, prana, ether, or ki, depending on the origin of the breach. When infused into an object, it drastically increases its durability and sometimes grants it borderline mystical properties. Several pieces of fantasy-like equipment have been recovered from the breaches, some of which possess abilities rivaling those of quirks. Before Izuku could ask, Nizu revealed, the catalyst for the Egyptian hero, Salam, becoming the apostle of Amon was the discovery of a scepter within a sarcophagus-like chest. He said that a window, similar to the one displaying his status, showed up after he had slain the griffin-like boss monster. It purportedly directed him to the location of a breach with no enemies. Instead, he discovered a pyramid-like temple guarded by the kinds of statues you'd find in an Egyptian-themed museum. After solving a few riddles, he was rewarded with the scepter of Amon, affording him his title and the ability to manifest a miniature Sunday. Furrowing his brows, Izuku remarked, Sounds like he was guided there by Amon himself. So he claims, replied Nizu, adopting a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes as he added, and he's not the only one. Several people bearing the title of champion or apostle have appeared, each claiming to have been in contact with entities known as star gods or constellations. To that end, there is something I've been meaning to ask you for quite some time. Narrowing his eyes slightly, Nizu asked, Have you been in contact with one of these constellations? Your title, Telania's champion, suggests this to be the case. However, as Ms. Chisaki bears a similar title, without any knowledge of the meta-world transversal phenomenon, I have doubts. As it was a good opportunity to alleviate some of the pressure on him, Izuku replied, I've yet to meet or hear from this Telania, but I've been in contact with an entity who referred to itself as a goddess, specifically on the 16th of June. It was around the same time that I began dreaming of Eri. Adopting a slight frown, Nizu asked, Is there a reason you kept such an important piece of information from us? You mean other than it sounding completely ludicrous? Asked Izuku. This was before I knew about the MWT phenomenon, and I had a lot of other things going on. It's not like I was trying to be disingenuous. I just wanted to understand the situation better before I started blabbing about gods and goddesses out of the blue. Exhaling a tired sigh, Nizu softly remarked, It appears I'm not the only one with trust issues. Then, before Izuku could comment, he raised his gaze staring directly at him as he said, Tell me everything. Shaking his head, Izuku asserted, If I knew everything, I wouldn't have kept it a secret. I know that Telania is the spirit or goddess representing our planet, and that I'm one of the people that has been chosen to protect the world from three great threats or trials. What those trials are, 
I have no idea. I'm assuming the meta world transversal phenomenon is one of them. But what we see now could be a byproduct of Telania attempting to prepare us for what's to come. An invasion, muttered Nizu, recalling Tashinori's account of what All for One had said to him during the I Island incident. Nodding his head, Izuka stated, That's another reason I kept silent. We have no way of knowing the true intentions of these constellations. What we do know is they can bestow great power unto their chosen. During my very brief encounter with a goddess, I gain nearly 20 levels in a title that ensures my party members and I are able to gain experience at a much faster rate than normal. Directing his gaze to the window, Izuku added, Stars and Stripes out there has the title Faith Champion, affording her 500 additional vitality and some pretty ridiculous perks. The description of her Avatar of Faith says she's been blessed by Telania, so it's fair to say she's an ally. Assuming that Telania truly is the will of our planet, remarked Nizu. If the breaches we've observed so far are an extension of her power, meant to prepare us for what's to come, it's clear she cares more about her own survival than the survival of humanity. Not that I can blame her. Humanity hasn't exactly been kind to the planet over the years. Regardless, there's a decent possibility that some, if not most, of the constellations making contact with people are representatives of the forces intending to invade our world, said Izuku, furrowing his brows as he added. For all we know, this is just a game to them. I can see why you would think that, remarked Nizu. First, there was the origin of quirks, superpowers that people had yearned to acquire for hundreds of years. Now, just as things are beginning to calm down, things have taken on a game-like format, complete with levels and attributes. If this is all the result of some higher power's influence, it's easy to imagine we're pawns in someone else's game. Adopting a smile, Nizu added, However, even if that's the case, I have no intention of simply giving up or yielding this world to outsiders. I may not be human, but this is the only world I've ever known. If nothing else, I will protect Japan to my dying breath. Returning a smile of his own, Izuka mused, then you can leave the rest of the world to me. That is, assuming I live long enough to awaken the true power of one for all. I tried awakening the power of flow when I went skydiving with Mina, but it appears I can only tap into the power of the previous users during a time of genuine need, or when my drive to win exceeds a certain threshold. If that's the case, you should have taken part in the provisional licensing exam. You're much stronger than other students, but you never know what can happen during a competition, remarked Nizu. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku argued, I needed a break after my time on Okinoshima. I may not have trained or exerted myself as much as the girls, but there is such a thing as mental exhaustion. Suffering from success, are we? Asked Nizu, adopting a teasing smile as he added, I'm honestly surprised Yusa Johnson didn't come with us. I know she has extenuating circumstances, but a brief stint in the States should have been manageable. Recalling the words Rumi had said to him the previous night, Izuku's smile gained an affection undertone as he revealed. She has her pet rabbits to look after and said she plans to whip the rest of my classmates into shape before my return. I almost feel bad for them. I'm sure she won't be too harsh on them, remarked Nizu. I wasn't planning to have her instruct any classes, so unless she sponsors a club, most of the students at UA won't even know she's a teacher. The same can be said for many of our new hires. Given the circumstances, I don't plan on publicizing our actual numbers unless there is a media probe or something similar. Makes sense, replied Izuku, hesitating for a moment before asking. Speaking of which, whatever happened to Aoyama, I know that my neta got dropped into the general department, but Aoyama was absent during the student assembly. Adopting a somewhat scary smile, Nizu asserted, You're probably better off not knowing. It's only a matter of time before you become entangled in politics, but the longer you can remain oblivious to what goes on behind the scenes, the happier you'll be. Feeling the atmosphere within the cabin change, Izuku swallowed the knot that had formed in his throat and simply nodded. He wasn't that curious to know what had happened to Aoyama. So, at least for the time being, he wouldn't press the matter. 
The gods knew he already had more than enough on his plate. After changing into a suit at the behest of Nizu, Izuku waited for the jet to land and taxi into a hangar before disembarking alongside the former, Tashinori, and Melissa. Waiting for them outside was a middle-aged, borderline elderly man in an Air Force dress uniform, for stars adorning each of his epaulets. Kathleen was also present alongside a group of men wearing green flight suits, but she remained in the background as the elderly man made his way forward to shake Nizu's paw, saying, Welcome to the United States, Mr. Nizu, in broken Japanese. Exhaling a soft chuckle, Nizu replied, Please, General, feel free to speak your native tongue, incomparably flawless English. Nodding his head, the General, also known as Adam Nimitz, responded with a curt, Then that's what I'll do. Before shifting his attention to Tashinori, his steely gray eyes glistening slightly as he said, It's been a long time, all might. It truly has, bellowed Tashinori. Last I saw you, you only had two stars on your shoulders. Congratulations, adopting a smile that would have earned a double take from most of the people that knew him. Nimitz extended a hand towards Tashinori as he joked. I have stars and stripes to thank for that. Being the commanding officer of America's number one hero has its perks. Though he accepted the general's handshake, Tashinori's gaze shifted to Kathleen, finding her staring at him with crossed arms and a broad smile on her face. Raising her right hand, Kathleen discarded propriety as she said, Yo, long time no see. All might. Have you enjoyed playing around in the kiddie pool that is Japan? Instead of taking offense at Kathleen's words, Tashinori exhaled a barrel-chested laugh before answering. Indeed. After all, protecting one's home and country is why most people become heroes. Before Kathleen could respond to Tashinori's words, General Nimitz frowned deeply and asked, Major Bates, why are you idling around here? Dismiss your men and prepare for our departure. In a stern, authoritative tone, offering a military salute, Kathleen responded with a loud, Yes, General Nimitz, before awaiting his return salute. Once he had, she turned to her men, ordering them outside before following after them. That's one thing I don't miss about being in the military, thought Izuku, following Kathleen's departure with his eyes. General Nimitz didn't seem too incompetent, but the number of officers that gained their ranks through nepotism and ass-kissing drastically exceeded those who earned their position. As such, they had a penchant for hammering down anyone that dared to stand out or express their individuality. Interrupting Izuka's thoughts, General Nimitz greeted Melissa before staring directly at him, asking, and who is this sharply dressed young man? Extending his hand, Izuku answered, Izuku Midoriya, also known by my hero name, Paragon. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance, General Nimitz. Raising his distinctly bushy brows, General Nimitz reciprocated Izuku's handshake as he remarked, Your English is exceptional. Certainly better than my Japanese. That isn't saying much, thought Izuku. Even as he outwardly replied, Thank you, sir. I've always dreamed of visiting the States and traveling through Europe, so I'm fluent in English, Spanish, and French. Seemingly ignoring Izuku's response, General Nimitz retracted his hand, returning his attention to Nizu as he said, We have a helicopter prepped and ready to transport you to your hotel, Mr. Nizu. The President and His Majesty's representative are anticipating your arrival. Exhaling a faint sigh through his nose, Nizu replied, Then it wouldn't do to keep them waiting. Please lead the way, General. With General Nimitz doing precisely that, Izuka followed behind Tashinori and Nizu with Melissa, the latter nervously remarking, I didn't think we would be meeting with the President. Furrowing his brows slightly, Izuku replied, Then let's hope we're simply going along for the ride before grasping Melissa's hand for support. In truth, he was also uneasy, but after his discussion with Nizu, he decided to go with the tried and tested fake-it-till-you-make-it mentality. He didn't feel like a super elite, but swinging his metaphorical meat grinder around shouldn't be too difficult. Though he expected to accompany Nizu, given that he had been asked to put on a suit, 
Izuku was fortunately incorrect in his assessment. Once they reached their destination, an ancient-looking but grand hotel called the Waldorf Astoria, he and Melissa were ferried away by members of the Secret Service, taken to their rooms, and instructed to remain inside. Fortunately, though they had been assigned separate rooms, the Secret Service agents didn't protest when Izuku informed them he wouldn't be letting Melissa out of his sight. Instead, their leader, a man with a literal lion's head, told them that if there was anything they required, including room service, they needed only to inform the agents standing outside. How exhausting, remarked Melissa, removing her shoes and taking a seat atop a fairly modern-looking couch. There were windows behind her that provided a view of the New York cityscape, but while the images displayed were genuine, the windows themselves were actually display screens. It's really strange, replied Izuku, removing his blouse and tie as he added. It hasn't even seven hours since I woke up, but I also feel like taking a nap. Care to join me? Adopting a wry smile, Melissa responded. That depends. Are you going to behave? I'd rather not do anything intimate when so many people are around. Nodding his head, Izuka took a seat next to Melissa, grasping her hand as he jokingly replied, yeah, I wouldn't put it beyond the Secret Service to have this entire building tapped and monitored. Returning a nod of her own, Melissa leaned against Izuku, placing her head against his shoulder as she remarked, They're probably scanning my father's jet as we speak. Probably, admitted Izuku, imagining General Nimitz frothing at the mouth as he ordered his mechanics to inspect and analyze the borderline sci-fi stealth jet. Its hull was impervious to most conventional scanning technologies, but with the power of quirks, anything was possible. Well, not like it matters, said Melissa, closing her eyes and adding. If countries shared their technology and worked together, overcoming the MWD phenomenon might not be an issue. Furrowing his brows, albeit only a little, Izuku resisted the urge to argue against Melissa's claim. He would never claim to understand the essence of people, but he could never be as hopelessly idealistic as someone like Tashinori. He wanted to believe in the innate goodness of humanity, but so long as there were disparities in power and status, there would always be a handful of individuals that fought tooth and nail to secure their place above others. The worst part was that he agreed with this sentiment, as, without competition, healthy or otherwise, humanity would stagnate, and the world would become a remarkably boring place. While Izuku and Melissa were taking it easy in the former's room, Nizu found himself seated in the conference room of the presidential suite, nursing a cup of coffee as he sat across from a constipated-looking man with slicked-back brown hair and an inordinately beautiful woman with pale blonde hair and dignified features, looking more like a queen than a politician. It's good to see the two of you again, said Nizu, adopting a somewhat mischievous smile as he added, though I suppose this is our first official meeting, isn't it? Indeed, replied the queenly woman, narrowing her icy blue eyes as she expressed, Japan usually acts as though it is disassociated from the rest of the world. It's pleasing to see you're taking this matter seriously, unlike some, with the queenly woman directing her gaze to him. The brown-haired man furrowed his brows and retorted, My country offered to put boots on the ground, but your prime minister rejected our proposal. You can't seriously expect the United States to support the United Kingdom financially while your country monopolizes the resources found within the breaches. Monopoly? parroted the woman, a glimmer of fury manifesting within the depths of her eyes as she stated, the United States has deployed more than 165,000 troops across Sudan, Ethiopia, Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia using the excuse of protecting investments. Even avarice has its limits, Mr. President. Undaunted by the woman's accusations, the President, James McKinney, remarked, People in your country have been calling this event the end of the world. Your Prime Minister was the one that requested this emergency summit arguing that the MWT phenomenon is a global threat. Yet, here you are, speaking of personal and national interests. None of us here were born yesterday, Madam Representative. We're all here because we have something to gain. Turning his attention to Nizu, President McKinney asked, 
Isn't that right, my fur-covered friend? Maintaining an unreadable smile, Nizu replied. While my views are more in line with Mrs. Pendragon's, I can't deny there is a considerable amount of truth to your words, Mr. President. The world would be much simpler if everyone worked together to forward global aims. But I fear the situation will need to become far direr before that happens. Exhaling a scoffing chuckle, President McKinney sat back in his chair and remarked, I'm still not convinced this is a serious threat. If anything, it's a tremendous opportunity. Our people have already made progress towards stabilizing the breaches. If they succeed, we can forget about populating other planets via space. We'll be able to teleport to other worlds directly. You mean you'll be able to harvest the resources of other worlds freely, asserted the blonde-haired woman, Julianne Soliopendragon. Casting a sidelong glare at Julianne, President McKinney retorted, as if Britain and the United Kingdom won't claim territory. You people invented colonization. Closing her eyes, Julianne calmly asserted, The history of every country is written in blood, inscribed upon the parchment of conquest. However, that does not mean things must remain as such. A truly modern society is one that moves beyond the limitations and prejudices of its predecessors, creating better conditions for all. Opening her eyes, Julianne turned to meet President McKinney's gaze as she added, There is a reason people with mutagenic and heteromorphic quirks can walk our streets freely while your country can't go more than a week without a school shooting or a high-profile hate crime. Clenching his teeth, President McKinney practically growled, The United States permits people with all manner of views to live within its borders. If we ousted everyone that caused problems, as your country does, it would incite a civil war. Inserting himself into the conversation, Knees amused. It appears the two of you have much to discuss between yourselves. Perhaps we should reconvene and have our chat later? My flight wasn't particularly long, but I'd like to rest before the summit's opening ceremony. No, it's better we speak before the summit, said President McKinney, crossing his arms as he expressed. I wanted to hear your opinion before you gave it to the General Assembly. You're regarded as the world's best economic advisor and data analyst. Tell me, what impact do you think this event will have on the global economy? I'm up for re-election this year, so any information you can provide would be beneficial. Though she frowned upon hearing President McKinney's words, Julianne focused on Nizu, clearly interested in what he had to say. What neither of them expected was for the diminutive chimera to adopt a broad smile and state. Put simply, if we don't get our collective acts together, there might not be a global economy in the next few years. I have sufficient reason to believe that the phenomenon we're observing right now is just the tip of a very large iceberg, and our countries are the proverbial ships sailing in the dark, tethered by unbreakable chains. If we stay our course and continue pressing forward without a beacon to guide us, we're going to sink. And I, for one, would like to avoid that particular outcome. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.